so that I can, you know, field lots of field questions. So I don't know how, where we are with that. I, I've noticed since we've been online forever is it's getting more and more unclear uh, when it's synchronous, when it's not, when it's synchronous, but taped, so see it later. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we're, that's what we're dealing with. So let me, let me briefly tell you what I saw as the components of all this, and then, and then I'd be really interested in hearing how that sounds from the student perspective, because it's, it's also virtual um, that I, it, and I keep posting things, but sometimes ev everything I post raises as, have as many questions as it answers sometimes. <laughs> um, so I see this, so most of my classes, including this one, I try and have a taped lecture. And did, so did that show up for you? It was about a half an hour. Um, I the saw other. the YouTube link. It was like oh. an intro or something. Yeah, it's about a 25 minute intro. Okay, so you saw that and you were able to get on that. Um, then there, I've posted the syllabus obviously. And then there's this open class slash um, mass office hour where the, the way I've used this before and wanted to use this here is it's a combination where I, I'll go off on certain tangents and I'll answer questions and I'll talk about, you know, Dora or Cosmopolitan magazine. That's in, in another quick question for you is, uh, did, did you find the prompt on, on the discussion? I, I looked quickly and I saw 15 people have posted anyway. Did, did you come across that? Um, I saw it, but I didn't know when it was due, so I haven't looked yes. too much into it. That's okay. I, I'm just trying to figure out what the <clears throat> what the connectivity is. <laughs> See, I'm, <laughs> I I I know what I post, but I don't always know what shows up uh, on your screen. Like like I, another class, they kept asking me for the syllabus, and I kept posting it, um, and they kept saying I can't find it. So it's very it's very frustrating to when you're not like in the classroom. Um, anyway, so so the prompt uh, they'll always be posted on the discussion, and my intro was partly an attempt to set you up to reflect on uh, on the prompt. Now, the reason I call them prompts and not assignments or mini essays they're they're three hundred to five hundred words. They're they're meant to be speculative on your part. You're supposed to experiment with some of the terms and ideas without worrying too much about you know, whether you're demonstrating mastery or not, I'm not, I'm not, the prompts are really about uh, sort of learning on the job, so to speak, where you, where you try and use the terms and see what happens and getting confused on the prompt is actually not a problem. <laughs> it's um, maybe even the point to, to, to have a venue where you can uh, air out your, your confusions, either partly so you can then ask questions and, and then maybe so you can kind of check yourself on uh on how you're doing um so the prompt um in which i talked about a little in the intro was about finding a cover of cosmopolitan uh and a cover of playboy magazine and i even posted some so when you go to the prompt and you can pick one i posted if you're having trouble finding one okay. uh, and this is going to be our first kind of initial attempt to think about the body in literature and in film, that, that's our main focus, but politics, uh, medicine, uh, virtually every other uh, discipline one can think of, they all play a role in formulating what they claim is, is the body. So uh, a lot of what we'll be reading, literature by Kafka and films by Kubrick and other people will, will be showing the result. And, and on, on the simplest level, this class is a bit about the body that we come to understand as ours and the bodies that we come to understand as other people's is it's, it's not that it's not true or that it's unreal, but it's it's the result of uh, discursive practices. It's the result of language, uh, definitions of gender, presum presumptions about um, how men, quote unquote, behave, what's feminine, what's masculine. So all of these things um, f formulate, and we come up with this idea of, of a body, which is ultimately based on anatomy, but it's not just anatomy. It's, in, it's enculturated. Um, hi, Lu hi, Lucia. Uh, welcome. We're, we're kind of wondering why there is such a tiny turnout. Did you have any trouble finding the link? Um, no, uh, I spotted it at the top of the 
I think it was part of the syllabus, right? Or it was yeah. part of the intro. Right. Was, yeah, um, kind of, was, right. I, I posted it all over the place. I, I oh, and here comes Chris. Okay. I don't know whether, whether 630 came through or not, <laughs> clearly. I also can't tell at this point how much you, how you students are figuring out when you should show up. <laughs> <laughs> when you shouldn't, when you need to, when you don't. I mean, I'm recording this and I will post it. And in that sense, <clears throat> you don't quote unquote have to be here. But of course I was, I am hoping for a modest turnout of, of, of live discussion because this, this isn't meant to be me. I'm not reading PowerPoints or delivering, um, uh, you know, formulaic lectures. I, I, I kind of, don't ever do that really, but I'm certainly not, not doing that um, here. But anyway, you're here uh, and Chris, Chris, so yeah, no, I, I'm not, um, I wasn't looking at you when I said 6.30, did, did, it, did it come through for you? Was it confusing? I never know what's confusing by the time what I, what I post gets to you guys. It's really kind of crazy. Normally I'd be in a class and I, I'd just ask and somebody would say something and I, I find out days later that I, I posted it in the wrong place, or or something else happened. Um, so so Chris, give me give me the, the the short story of how did you how did you get on here tonight? Oh well, it's just easier for me to talk if that's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I thought it was a uh, six. That's what it says on the timetable in Acorn, right? So that's what I assumed. Oh, uh, okay. So you think a lot of people signed on in six and then thought there was some something happened um, because see, I, I didn't did, want. Yeah. To, yeah, the thing is, I I don't want this to be three hours. That would be an endless uh, office hour. So I I bracketed it six thirty to eight, not six to nine, and and I put that in all the posts. But that might have, maybe that's the point, right? Now people I do are see those back. In, in the posts. Yeah, I do see like that. It's six thirty. To aid in wow the all right okay well i thought maybe i was just going insane which is also we you know probably certainly likely <laughs> but uh um so people are probably circling back well i did just repost it and now i do see i see names showing up so all right it wouldn't it wouldn't be COVID if something wasn't screwed up um at the start and that if, so I'll say that for the sake of the recording and for those of you here, we're going to bracket this 6.30 uh, to 8. Now, I, I'm, I'm willing, I'm perfectly happy to go beyond 8, and we may, we may go beyond 8, uh, but I, I didn't want to um, imprison you for, for so long. So uh, if we go past 8 because the questions are still going, and, and also because think of this as an off, more of an office hour than, than a lecture class. I don't mind if you drop in a little late. I don't mind if you uh, can stay for 45 minutes and then have to go. I, I'm going to record it start to finish. And it's not a lecture. So it's not like I've got this beginning, middle and end. So I really don't mind drop ins, just like you just like an office. If, if you guys can remember what that is, where, <laughs> where the door is open and you come and go and you stick your head around the corner. And, and uh, that's the atmosphere I'm trying to create virtually. Uh, um, and uh, Okay, good. So I'm glad I got, I have a few more of you guys so that I can get some, some more questions. I was, I was explaining to Asia, uh, who, uh, who gets the, uh, gets the gold star today because she showed up first at, <laughs> at 640. Um, but, but Asia, did you have that confusion too? Or were you working off the prompt and you kind of knew you, that you should, you were going to show up around 630? I didn't know. I just kind of showed up. I thought it was at six and then I came early and then. <laughs> okay. So you yeah. did exactly. Oh God, you did the same thing. Uh, good. Well, I, I'm a big advocate for just showing up even when you don't know what's going on. So <laughs> then things tend, tend to, to work out from there. Uh, what I had just started briefly with Asia is trying to lay out the components of this class. And every week I will try and I will be posting anything. It could be 30 to 30 to 60 minutes. I don't have a set rate. It will be a pre-taped intro to what I imagine is going to happen in the uh, in the office hour. And it will usually introduce the prompt. This is what I tried to do in that 30 minute piece. It's already up. Uh, the, the deadlines for the prompts are are quite flexible. Uh, roughly speaking, 
um, I would, I don't think I'm going to give a prompt every single week. I realize, for instance, and you guys can tell me what you think if you've had a chance to look, that the prompts are fairly substantial. I mean, even though it's only 300, 500 words, I think most of the work of the prompt is just getting your head around the prompt. Uh, and the, what you actually write will be relatively a, a summary, I would imagine. And, and as I said earlier, I'm encouraging you to be speculative. I, uh, I'm, I would, I would, if you're confused, state your confusion. Like, you know, Professor Leonard said this, but what's why did Freud do that? What is Dora doing? Uh, what's going on with this this Cosmo Mag? Whatever, whatever the deal is, your, your confusion is invaluable <laughs> to me. Uh, addressing what what you're not getting with with um, precision, instead of just lecturing and lecturing and lecturing and hoping that uh, that you catch on. There's this there's so much material. There's so many ways to talk about the body as a representation, and and it's so multifactorial. Like there is no one thing that gives us an idea of what our body is. It's it's as I said with that Barbara Kruger image. Uh, where she famously says, your body is a battleground and shows the, that was 1989, and shows a woman's face as a black and white photo and the, and the other half of her face as a negative of that photo. So it was, so a split down the middle of, of a woman's face. And it looks like a cover in a way of, of a magazine. And Barbara, Barbara Kruger started her career at Mademoiselle um, and even briefly at Cosmopolitan. So she began as a graphic artist for women's magazines. And uh, that was her basis, and then she struck out as a as an important um, uh, graphic artist of the uh, of the eighties and nineties, and even up till today. Uh, so she began inside the industry, and and her art clearly still borrows the the typology of of graphic art of magazines, and in a sense um, sets it in conflict with itself. So you'll see like magazine type headlines in her work. Um, but they, they are headlines that challenge what's going on with media representation. So your body is yourself is a great example of that. And instead of the typical Cosmo cover, which you guys would have seen some of, where there's an immediate turning away from any self-consciousness about what, what does it mean to represent a woman on the cover of a magazine? You know, every month, surrounded by competing discourse, um, so that there's there's an announcement of an article about sexuality, an article about diet, and an article about fashion, an article about essentially gender performance, how to how to uh, attract attention. Um, and uh, I'm, but I'm going to interrupt. Well, I want you to interrupt me in the chat because I will interrupt myself to answer questions. I, I, I'm just glancing at Preventa's because this is also an inf information session. So Preventa writes, "Sorry, Professor, not to interrupt you, but please do interrupt me. Um, I want to be interrupted. I'm, I'm asking you to interrupt me. How else would you get in a word edgewise anyway? Um, not to interrupt you, but this week's discussion, when is it due? Are we able to still do it? Yes, you absolutely are. I just want to make sure to not miss the deadline. The deadline for all the prompts up to the midterm is when you, when you have to upload the midterm. So you have, a, you have plenty of time. I encourage you to do the prompts as I, you know, if you can, I'm, and I think I'm going to post every other, I'm going to give you a prompt every other week and not every single week. It'll still be the same percentage. But I think that'll give us more time. These are pretty substantial prompts, and, and I'd rather let them be substantial and, and work them out. Uh, because the prompt that I just gave you, cover of Cosmo, representation of the body, that's going to be relevant the whole course. And, and that's what I try to do with the prompts, is they're not specifically, I mean, we'll talk about Dora, uh, obviously, but I could have given this prompt the, the, the last week of class, and it still would you just would have approached it with a lot more background, but I have to start somewhere. Uh, so well, I'm just sort of tossing you in the water and, and encouraging you to figure out how to swim with a rope around your waist so you don't sink. I mean, that's kind of the way the, the course is. So uh, uh, Sheila, does that, does, that address, does that answer the question about when these prompts are due? Either Sheila or Pavena. 
Yes, same. Thank you so much. Okay, so you did get it. Okay, what format is the midterm and finals? Are the midterm and finals in person? Thank you. I did understand it. I'm just letting you know. Sorry for that. Thank you. It's no, no, no. Just this is supposed to be on office hours. So it's kind of, I know it's a little awkward, but just speak up or type or do anything you want. No, I just wanted to make sure to let you know. Thank you. I understand like what it's doing stuff. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate it. Not at all. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the, for the question. Uh, so let's keep going with logistics for a moment. Uh, what formats the midterm and finals? Midterms and finals are not in person. Uh, what I will do is post them. A midterm is mid-February, the, the, the final is mid-April. Um, typically I'll, I'll be posting them and then I give you a four day window. I, so I post it as an assignment. And you have a four day window to upload your response. My sense is that, you know, roughly it's about a four hour exercise. I'm not gonna do a timed four hours. That's, that's a lot of pressure for everybody. Uh, you might not be feeling well, you might have an errand. So what I prefer to do is give you a four day window to do a four hour exercise roughly. It's obviously open book, whatever that means in, in this context. Um, and then the format, if any of you have had A10 or A11 or even a lot of my classes, I use a very similar format in, in all my classes. And what that format is, is I give you a, uh, a, 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 a again, it's a rather long prompt in a way, although it's, it's a lot more specific to, to major points that have been made in the lectures. So the prompts I put in discussion for you to have fun with the 200 to 500 words, those are just meant for you to do what you want with them in a way. The, the difference with the midterm is I'm gonna give you a, a question that is uh, tailored to major issues and points that have been brought up by my taped lectures, by the, by the, open, uh, by the open class, et cetera. And then I give you roughly four excerpts from works on the syllabus. So uh, there, could, there could be one, there could be a sec segment from Freud's Dora. Uh, there could be a cover of a different Cosmo that, that we haven't looked at. There could be a passage from a Kafka story. I've, I've, there could be a, a sequence from The Three Faces of Eve, which is a movie that we're watching shortly. And then we're watching another movie called 13. So there'll be a total of, <clears throat> of four of these. And you'll, have, you'll be asked to answer or, or, or discuss the issues raised in this midterm prompt question, specifically working through the, the four excerpts I give you. That's that's the key. And that's where it's, again, it's different than just saying, what do you think? Or uh, um, I want you to really, because I'm going to pick these excerpts carefully. I mean, uh, they're going to be highly curated. So my, in fact, the, the relationship between my question and the four excerpts will be what I like to call mutually constitutive. I, I will have partly designed the question based on the excerpts I chose. So it isn't random at all. And that doesn't mean there's one answer because there is it. There's a, the, the challenge is to put the four excerpts I give you in play relative to this question, understanding that in designing the question, I was thinking about the excerpts and in picking the excerpts, I was thinking about the question. So I've, I've, create, I've tried to create a dialogue between the question and the excerpts. Your job is to position yourself in, in, that, in that dialogue. Um, there's, th there is no one answer. It's so it's about how well can you relate the the issues of the excerpts and the and the question surrounding it. Um, it. It's hard to be more more clear than that. Although I'll try. The final is the same format. It's just that different question. Four more excerpts from everything since the midterm. Uh, so technically not cumulative. It's not in terms of the excerpts. Although you're you're allowed to go where you want in the in the final, but you'll still want to make sure you deal with the excerpts that I give you. Uh, as as I just said a minute ago, um, this is well, I didn't put it this way, but let me let me say this: it's, this is a very cumulative class. We don't leave behind any weeks as as we move forward. Everything is is accumulating. So the groundwork we do tonight. Um, is the, is the basis of what we do next week, which continues to be the foundation of what we do the following week, which is the other reason I like the prompts, because 
and why I ask you to go to the discussion tab and to write your prompt under responses uh, where, where other people can see it, where I can see it, obviously, and where you can see it. Um, because come, come the midterm, you might want to look again at one of your own prompts um, and notice that, oh, okay, now I, I have a better handle on this. And, and it, can, it can help your confidence level as, as you, uh, 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 you know, move beyond that. Let's see what other questions I might be getting. Format of the midterm and the finals. They're not in person. Uh, Discord link for the class, good. I'm not sure what that is, but it sounds good. Um, that means you guys can talk among yourselves, <laughs> perhaps, and, and not just here. Uh, how do we schedule a time to meet with you for office hours? Well, that we can do that. Um, uh, obviously, this is an office hour, but when you want to have a one on one, what we need to do, because everything is just like the Wild West as far as how to hook up, is uh, send me an email, Leonard Gary, L E O N A R D G, or I'll just, can I just type it? Yeah. This, so this is the email I check on, on a, just for classes. Uh, and I still get 50, 60 emails a day. I have, I have just so you know, I have over 600 students um, in, in the three classes. So if, if it seems not easy to always get me, uh, that's, that's part of it. I tried, I really try to be as available as possible. So what, what you could, when you wanna have a one-on-one, -on -one, send me a request in the email, I'll get back to you. The way I can be most helpful with one-on-ones is, is for you to, in a sense is to, is to let your confusions pile up so that you're, so that you have a lot of, you have some idea of what you would like me to help you with. Uh, Cause you don't need yet another lecture from me in, in, in a one-on-one -on -one format. So it, I, I, typically the best one-on-ones if, if we're going to go there is for you to exercise, to talk out loud about what you think is going on and invite me to, um, to tweak it. Uh, it, it. It works better in this format to show up and say, uh, what did you mean by what you said about Dora or, or, or something like that? Because it's partly an efficiency problem, I suppose, is, is that most of the questions you would have, a lot of questions you might have for me one-on-one, -on -one, everybody is interested in. Um, you can also ask questions to Leonard at hotmail.com that may or may not require an in-person link. I'll answer your question and I encourage the questions because then I can also go to announcements um, when it's a general interest question and, and give the answer I gave you to the class. One of the biggest challenges I'm finding with, with all this Zoom stuff is uh, I it's very hard for me to chart where, where you guys are confused because you're out there in the ethers somewhere. So the more any of you can supply and if something comes up in Discord, where you guys are chatting and they say, somebody write it down and say, I'll ask, I'll ask Professor Leonard. Uh, um, if you're all saying, what does he mean? Why do he say that? What if, maybe it means this, maybe it means that. Then send it to me. Let me, let me uh, try and clarify it. Um, uh, the writing prompts good practice for the midterm since earlier you said it's a good way to work with the material. Yes, and that's absolutely a conscious part of their design. Um, the difference, I suppose, between a prompt and when you're actually doing the midterm is the prompt is a sandbox, if you will. Um, it's where you play and you can make different shapes and th if things fall down, who cares? You're, 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 you're playing with it. Um, a wood shop, a sandbox, something like that. And then for the midterm, you'll just try and be a little, be more focused on the excerpts I give you and, and the question that I give you. But you will have already been uh, working with the material uh, uh, by then. As, as I said, the prompts are, are, don't have deadlines. Um, the re nothing technically has a deadline. It's just that the more informed you are on a given week, um, the more I can, the more accurately I can interact with you. Like for, I doubt all of you have read the entire Dora excerpt. Some of you may have. Um, what I would what I would suggest is even when you can't get all the reading done, like the short story or or you haven't finished the movie, uh, don't let that stop you from showing up. 
you can you can watch the rest later you can read the rest later and you're and i don't mind you commenting on what it, on what you've read so far so i feel like this with this new format we we have to be open to dropping in and dropping out i did some of the reading but not all of it we just have we have to work with what we have and uh not worry about some sort of platonic perfect thing where everybody's seen the whole movie and everybody's read every word i'm not really uh worried about that um i'll only it's just that the don't get too behind and try and be acquainted with at least some part of the materials if you haven't finished the prompt for that week it's also okay uh but feel free to to start it um would we get any comments back for the prompt so we know if we're on the right track with our interpretations yeah now because it's i believe there's 120 in this class so it's it's unrealistic for me to promise some kind of detailed response for every, all of you guys. What I will do is I, I will read them, uh, I, all of them, in fact, and I will be doing quick comments as I go. Whenever I what, I, what I'll be scanning for is a good points. So I'll take a moment that that'll help with with your question, Lucia. That because if I say good point, obviously you're on the right track. Uh, the other thing I'll scan for is is uh, yes, that's true, but but remember also, or um, kind of sometimes I'll connect your idea back to several ideas. Th if you think of this class, and if you think even of the body and of our our sense of the body, it's a little like a mobile. You know, I I, I don't know how many mobiles you guys have seen in your life. It's it's popular to put mobiles above a crib, as uh, some of you may have had them as a kid or. Uh, maybe you've already given them as a um, as a shower present. Um, there's a lot of interest in mobiles above cribs, which is interesting in itself, because if the body is an attempt to stabilize multiple moving parts, then isn't coming stabilizing a body a lot like a mobile uh, in, in the sense that it, it, it moves all the time, but then you want to bring it back to some point of balance. So when you when you have a baby's mobile above the the crib, you can you can nudge it, all the pieces start moving, and the baby's often fascinated and they watch them all moving, and then the mobile slowly comes back to stability. And although I doubt that's that was the point of your auntie or whoever might have given you a mobile, it, it, there's a there's a there's a strange cultural recognition that stabilizing the body. And finding a way to get back to a stabilized point um, is an exercise we all do all the time. And I mean, the fact that it's so common for people to say, I'm really upset, you see, it, it, that means somebody just bumped into my mobile in a way, like all my little parts are moving, or even I'm really excited. So it, it doesn't, it can be, it can feel negative. It can feel positive. Either way, all your parts move. Um, somebody, somebody that you like paid attention to you, that's going to move your parts around. Somebody that you like ignored you, that's going to move your parts around. The, what we're interested in, in a way, in this class is how much the body is a mobile, not a monolith. It's a the body is a mobile is a is a mobile that masquerades as, as a monolith, and especially in modernity, which we'll be talking about too, like to contextualize the historical period that we're in, there's a lot of emphasis on individualism or even what I might call the cult of individualism, this, this sense that we're all separate. And if we're all separate, then we all have distinct bodies. And biologically, that would seem more or less true. But this emphasis, and I think I mentioned this in my lecture, that the body is a discrete entity that doesn't make any sense. Um, you have smell, you have taste, you have touch, you experience hot and cold. Um, you you can read somebody, you can or think that you're reading somebody's expression, and they might be judging you or they might be delighted with you. Um, so the the body is completely porous. I mean, and we even the skin, and then you have lungs. So you're so you are in continual contact. With, with everything around you, psychologically and physically. And yet we still insist on this, on this kind of hypercritical model of discrete bodies. And that's partly 
and that's gotten more ferocious in in modern culture partly because we have built up a consumer culture and consumers consumer culture one way to think about it is the 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 work of feeling like an individual has has passed over into the market and and into the market economy uh you can you can flip open cosmo at random and every ad will be it will be offering whatever it's selling to shore up your individuality uh, so this, so the lipstick that maybe mass produced for 5 million people is for you. I mean, and, and this is the, the paradox that we, we look past, um, mass produced items grant individuality. Well, that's, that's a logical inconsistency, but it works, um, because individuality is, a, is, is such an exhausting effort to pretend that the mobile is a monolith is is so exhausting we look we look for help and even when uh even when advertisements for instance suggest that they will help you with your relationality so a perfume ad for a woman might it almost always implies implicitly or explicitly this will make you more attractive to someone you'd like to be attractive to which, which would suggest like, well, so bodies can't be that discreet, but, it, but it's socially regulated so that um, heterosexuality is presented with this kind of hyper complementarity uh, that, that the, perf the perfect, your perfect other half is, is the opposite of your gender performance. So what I call com uh, a kind of um, hyper uh, complementarity of gender performance where, and in fact, I don't even have to make the point that there was a, there was a perfume ad. I think I mentioned this at the end of my lecture, uh, want him to be more of a man, try being more of a woman. Now that, that if it, I should use that as a, that's as a, every bit as profound a slogan as your body is a battleground, even though it's being actually used to sell perfume. Granted in the fifties, I think that slogan might raise some eyebrows now because it, it, we now, feminism, first, second, third wave has all made us a, a little a much more, or should have, sensitive to um, not demanding that women perform to magnify men's appreciation of themselves. I, I'm not sure it's changed that much, but, but our, our awareness uh, about it has. So, uh, so an ad like that might raise an eyebrow, but I don't think that dynamic has changed. Uh, there, there is a recognition that masculinity and femininity are gender is a performance in relation to power and they are mutually constitutive there is no it's impossible to conceive of femininity without talking about masculinity and vice versa neither one exists except in relation to the other so they both exist but neither one in isolation uh, they call each other into being, and uh, but they're not the same performance, and and the kind of performance they are is is highly socially regulated. If we talk, if we think about Dora for uh, for a moment, um, you know she is being asked to perform a role in the family, which and it's a role that is also associated with her gender. So she is the daughter of a wealthy, successful man uh, and the daughter of, uh, of, of her mother. Uh, the mother and father seem relatively estranged. The father is often, it's funny, it's, it's inconsistent when you read Dora's account because the father comes across it as, as kind of br uh, brusque and healthy, and also as very infirm. It's very, it's it, it's hard. It almost seems like two different men. The way Freud describes it, uh, and one can't. I, I at least can't uh, uh, get over the possibility that that he uses his quote unquote infirmity to control his um, surroundings. Not least of all, because whenever he, especially in the early days, whenever he was ill, he went to a nearby town. Uh, where his mistress, who was married to someone else, uh, also lived. Um, 
So there was a reason for him to say that he felt sick and needed to go and recover. And at the age of 14, uh, Dora first is awakened through, through physicality to the structuring role she has in the, in the world that the adults have constructed, uh, which roughly speaking is that the Dora's mother and father are, are estranged. Dora's father's having an affair uh, with, uh, with, with, with a woman um, called Kay, and then her husband is called Hare Kay. And Hare Kay, who is the husband of, uh, of the woman that Dora's father is having an affair with, is it's hard to tell exactly how much he knows or how much he's tolerating the affair, but there's some awareness. And some, the reason Dora's fallen ill is, is as she, beginning at the age of 14, even though she was going there earlier, Herke is showing an interest in, in Dora, uh, a romantic slash sexual interest that Dora is trying to understand. She's 14. And the, the, you know, the first time she uh, experienced that was he contrived, Herke contrived to have her kind of alone in his office to see a local parade and, uh, and then kissed her. Um, and she was startled and pushed him away. And that, that was at 14. She told her mother about it, who told her father about it, who confronted Herr K, who consulted with his wife and the wife, and they all agreed that Dora was, um, had made it up. And, and, they, and things was, so the mobile of the family unit was supposed to go back into some kind of, uh, and Herr K, I guess, was warned, like back off, she's 14. It's it's un, it's really hard to tell how much people how much these adults in her life genuinely persuaded themselves that she had an overactive imagination, and the degree to which their own psychological compensations were so necessary to them, it's, it's so inconceivable for them to, to have them challenge that they they really couldn't conceive of uh, letting Dora step out of of her position. It it was a kind of house of cards and were she to abandon her post the whole thing would collapse and uh, it seems like almost nobody for for very different reasons nobody seemed to want to have that to happen In, including the most obvious case would be uh wouldn't dora's mother want to end this situation but she wanted as little to do with dora's father as possible so there was a set what freud calls a secondary gain to what would appear to be uh, a negative circumstance. Um, um, a, a wife aware that her husband is being unfaithful would, would seem like a situation you'd want to address unless there was a secondary gain to the father having his interests elsewhere. The mother seemed to have settled into uh, a, a, an isolated life where she tried to control the household. As, as much as, as possible. And that's where she got her stability and, and, uh, and her security. Um, okay, so somebody, I'm just keeping an eye on the, uh, on the chat. Um, is, there, is there anyone else out there who got into the, into the door reading at all that had some reactions or, uh, or questions? Anybody among the however many people are here? Uh, yes, I hate Freud. <laughs> Good. Uh, well, let's start. Let's start with that. Um, not not a hard guy to hate in a way. So that's that's a fair question. Uh, but but, but un, unpack that for me, as as Freud might say. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah. Uh... To me, when I was reading it, it really sounded like somebody who had been assaulted um, and then a whole bunch of adults and predominantly adult men saying, oh, no, you should you should like this or this should have excited you. And it's weird that it didn't excite you. Um, mm -hmm. But to me, it's like the guy was grooming her and it's very weird. And I just... 
I know I just I hated so much of what Freud said um, about that and the whole you know she's actually in love with her father and right. that's why she's jealous like it just no I, <laughs> I yeah. hated it I thought it yeah. was so wrong yeah I think well I think it in, in a lot of ways it is so wrong uh, and what's so weird about this document the, the door is, is it you know he wrote it down within months of 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 Dora breaking off the analysis, which which is like, yay, Dora, right? I, it, he didn't see it coming at all. And she simply said, this is our last day and and stopped. I, I think she was getting, she was getting more out of Freud than anyone else, which, which is not to say she was getting a lot. I mean, he he can said, yeah, I th and I think Dora was right. Once in a while he'd say, yeah, I think Dora was right. Her father didn't tell me everything. Her father was very selective. Uh, he, he clearly sees, issues with the father. And he, he even understands why Dora wants him to break off however we define this affair. Um, it's at, at a minimum, it's a psychological affair. And, and one could be forgiven for, for assuming that the father is um, insisting that I'm, I'm physically infirm. So I can't, so what, how much could I be doing? Well, yeah, I mean, who knows? Um, but oh yeah, I'll, I'll enable the transcript if you guys like to, to read it. I, I just saw that. Um, I just can't look at the transcript because watching what I say show up in print right away is uh, I have to put a piece of paper over it <laughs> anyway. Um, but but thank you for, for raising this issue because what I think the reason we still read Dora and the reason I assigned it is what I was just saying about gender performance. That Freud is trying to show without even realizing it and even though he's Freud for Pete's sake, he is showing up <clears throat> Um, myths of masculinity that he doesn't recognize as, as myths. And, be, and in order to do that, he has to impose on her facts, quote unquote, of femininity that are myths. So one way to think, you know, is to watch this dance of fact myth. And every time, every time Freud makes an, uh, a declarative statement, that's when he seems the most wrong. It, it, so for instance, to, to to go to the point you uh, uh, that you raised, at one point he says, "Obviously, this Herke grabbing her and kissing her is just the thing to to uh, excite a fourteen year old girl." Like, I mean, he didn't even qualify, which is unbelievable and from from today's perspective. And this isn't really a case, I think, where we can say, "Oh well, he did the best he could. He was a late Victorian." I mean, <laughs> there's. Um, it, it, it's I'm. I think even in the 1900s, that's a odd, uh, it, it's odd to be so sure. And for a man who practically invented ambiguity in, in, in the 20th century, for the, the, the man who said you never can be sure that anything um, is what it purports to be. In fact, taking it further and saying nothing is what it purports to be. And, and partly that was Freud's legacy. So it's, it's shocking to see him, maybe not, shouldn't be so shocking, that, but he's, when it comes to him personally in relationship with Dora, who frankly, I think he, he found unexpectedly threatening. She was very smart. She was, uh, we, we don't have a lot, we don't have an actual transcript. He occasionally lit, puts things down in her words, but not that often. And one gets the feeling in, in, in retrospect, when you read this piece that, the door, that Freud was on the defensive, uh, the, the whole analysis. And, and he, in his own mind, at least consciously, he was, he, it was like he kept saying, I'm Freud and I'm inventing psychoanalysis. And uh, the, and you need to be an example that, of my theories. I mean, I think that's what Dora finally got fed up with. What I think Dora initially appreciated is relative to her family, at least, here was someone who A, let her talk at all, and B, seemed to grudgingly concede uh, some of her, uh, the, the, uh, the veracity of, of some of her reality. I, when I read Dora, it's clear to me that Dora is looking for some help with reality checking. From the age of 14 to 18, she has had to make her way through this unconscious morass of, of her parents and uh, of, of K, Mrs. K and Herr K. And she's desperate for somebody to help her just say, yeah, I see that too. And Freud did that some. The problem is that too often Freud winds up saying, yes, she was right. Um, but if I was going to cure her, I needed to get her to figure out how to align herself with this situation. Um, and the, 
it's amazing to me that he thought it was the way this, to solve this was for her to understand that Herr K was courting her. Um, and I always, you know, I, I, every time I read this, I'm like, yeah, but he's married. And, and at one point Freud does say, well, yes, but they've talked about divorce. So he has this an, a, a, a kind of crazy idea that if, if uh, Dora would simply allow Herr K to continue his quote unquote courtship, and I think grooming is a better name, uh, this would have a happy ending. He would then divorce his wife. Presumably, Dora's father would then have unlimited access to Herr K's former wife. We don't know what Dora's mother would do because I, I think the other massive manipulation and failure on Freud's part not is, is he ignores Dora's mother. Uh, and and I, I really want to emphasize that because we're going to see ignored mothers all over the place when we see how femininity gets constructed. It is, it's, it is so phallocentric. It's so masculine based. And in a way, Freud introduces this idea that we still are wrestling with, which that, that the daughter, a daughter quickly moves on from a relationship with the mother to solving the tensions of the relationship with her father by formulating uh, a track uh, desire for, for, the, for the masculine, for, for the future husband, ideally. For, so wanting to have, want, love, falling in love and wanting to have a baby with, some, with a man that's not your father um, is the way out, so to speak, of, uh, of and what is, what, what I see reading between the lines is how, because we don't get Dora's transcript. I think she talks about her mother way more than Freud lets on because every time he does allow anything about the mother to come in, it's, it's incredibly um, uh, under pressure. I mean, the, the, you haven't read this section yet, but I'm gonna post it, but she comes in at one point and sa says how she got lost in a reverie of two hours looking in a, in a museum looking at a painting of, of the mother and the Christ child for two hours. And Freud works that in as though it, it finally comes out with it doesn't have anything to do with her mother, which <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Um, and uh, so, but this, this, I, the reason I use Dora in this class is, is I, I wanna show, I wanna be really clear. I wanna go back to the beginnings of, uh, of what, what has been one of the most powerful contemporary discourses in the 20th and the 21st century, psychoanalysis, yeah, psychotherapy. And I, I don't wanna throw out the baby with the bathwater, if you'll pardon the pun. I mean, the th therapy there has, has a lot of talk therapy can I think still be very helpful, but it's a great example of how, of how the body is, the body that we think we have, that we think we know, that we imagine others have is, is so much of a verbal construct. Um, so your body is a battleground, a contested site for competing discourses. Your, your body, the, the, your awareness of your body as, as a, mobile, a mobile that you're capable of occasionally stabilizing um, is, uh, is also continually being transected by competing discourses. So, uh, so first I gave, so I gave you Dora, but then I also gave you the covers of Cosmopolitan, which would seem to be wild, wildly different, but they're not in, in structural terms, they're not different at all. You have a body being inscribed by language in a female body being inscribed by language in Dora. You have a female body on the cover of Cosmo being immediately covered with words. Uh, it, you know, it seems like a weird thing to say, but why not? Why not publish Cosmopolitan with just the word Cosmopolitan and and a woman standing there? It's it's like, well, you can't do that. Of course, you could do that, but it seems almost inconceivable um, because we're so uh, we're so used to this idea that the 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 hookup between uh, gender construction, commodification, and consumption is is so seamless. Uh, that we, we expect if there's a body, there needs to be language. And the, the other point I wanna, something to bear in mind this whole class is not 
you know, do we have a body or not, which obviously we do, and this comes up a lot, but how does the body become culturally intelligible? And that, that's a phrase I'll probably be repeating. How does the body emerge? So I'm not saying there is no body, and, and sometimes people push, push back against structuralism and post-structuralism and all these things I'm talking about by saying, we all have bodies, so what are you talking about? Um, yeah, you, you can have a body and still ask, how do you become aware of that? Um, what, what makes your body culturally intelligible? And one, one of the biggest things is gender performance. Why is it a, you know, performances make things intelligible. If, if you do impressionistic dance or, or ballet, things, even things without words, what, it, you know, what is dance, whether it's ballet or modern dance, except using the body in space to, to make various, to, to evoke various emotions in, in terms of how your body is moving in space. I mean, that's, that's what dance is. And, um, and so uh, ballet or any number of dances is, is, is a demonstration of how you make the body uh, culturally intelligible. So that, it, so that it's seen. And we, it, I don't want us to present this as, as chronically negative. I mean, we, in a way we have to be culturally intelligible uh, to, uh, to function. Uh, so the, the, the point of this class is not going, it's not meant to be, don't culturally emerge because every time you do, you, you, the, the way you've emerged will have been inflected and distorted and refracted. That's true. <laughs> um, but the point of if this course offers you anything, it's it's not it's that we we all have to culturally emerge. The where what what's be what would be useful is what's what what is the surrounding discourse that permits the cultural emergence, and that's where Dora is, also, is so interesting because Freud is offering Dora a way to culturally emerge, but it's the it's it's a it's a, a way that's very um, negative for her uh, and and in fact has very little it doesn't even allow her to develop uh, a choice of, of well, like who does she like I mean who knows he doesn't seem to he's like this man has shown an interest in you there's a structure that that could be continued and adjusted so that it is under less pressure if, if you would concede to Herke's demands uh, and, and Dora would be well within her rights to say, well, you know, so what? what? Why, who said I had, why is that my role? Why is that my uh, function? And to, to a certain extent, that, that is a problem that has marked femininity from the beginning, is that it is, it is not allowed even, uh, it, it's seen as a performance that permits cultural structure. And masculinity is often seen as simply an essential, an essentialist experiential being in the world. So men, quote unquote, simply are, and women perform. And I mentioned that the genders are, are mutually constitutive. So men cannot get away with this myth that they merely are. Uh, without the performance of femininity. And Freud's a case in point. Psychoanalysis cannot be, it cannot emerge unless Dora understands, unless Dora performs it, as, as, a, as a, a proper uh, um, subject to the discourse. And she's not doing that. Um, Partly because she doesn't fit, and partly because she just is angry and doesn't want to uh, be manipulated anymore. Um, but what I'm, what I want you guys to notice while you're reading this and while you're trying to do your prompt with with the Cosmo covers and and so on, it's, is become aware of the of the mobile. Like what offers you uh, the. What, how does discourse offer you ways to stabilize your concept of your body, other bodies, yourself in relation to bodies? And what's the price of a, of, of a given um, 
structural offer. Uh, because if there's, if, if, if literature and film, to pick our topic, uh, offer uh, a, a, a way to, to push back against constructions that have been naturalized. And, and that's, a, that's another um, uh, point of that. Uh, oh, let me look at comments because it looks like there's some good comments here. Hold on. Um, yes, I hate Freud. <laughs> Freud definitely feels biased uh, at the start. Yeah, I, I find the letter, it, it, this, I put excerpts from his letters to his colleague Fleiss and, and he sounds so smug. Uh, it, it, he's like, the case has opened up to my, uh, my lockpick devices. So right from the start, he, the metaphor he uses for Dora is a locked box. And that's already problematic that, um, yeah, I'm just noticing this laser is probably a little distracting. I don't know, maybe you used to, how else can I do that? Something, I don't know. Um, and uh, so, the, so she's simply a box to be open. And uh, this, this is a concept of the woman that, that persists throughout the, the early days of, of psychoanalysis and, and, and into the, the present. Um, it's a presumption of mastery over, uh, over Dora. And um, I want this, <laughs> I'm gonna try something here. This, let me know if you can see this. I, I, I don't have any sophisticated blackboards. So I just, uh, I drew this today um, and I'll, I'll post a better version of it because it's gonna be, it's gonna involve your second prompt. This is partly based on the works of, of Lacan who, who also tried to push forward from the work of Freud. And what I want you to see here is, as so I have a box and there is S1, S2 product, and then this, and then an S with a line through. So you can even draw this if you've got note in front of you so you can start to see it in, in, right in front of you. This is one of what, uh, this is about how, this is Lacan's attempt to diagram how discourse affects uh, and language affects the body. It's not just that, but it, but for for the moment, it it certainly is. That's what we're talking about. So imagine S one as Freud, and imagine S two as Dora. In fact, you can write that in your little diagram if you're if you're playing at home. <laughs> um, so Freud, so Freud addresses Dora. And theoretically, he seems to be, it's, it's not, but it's not really a dialogue. Freud is the master and, and Dora is the subject. So even though Dora tries to talk back to Freud, uh, because he's in control of the discourse, not only how the session goes that, that actually happened, but also how it gets written down, what, what he really, what his, what his discourse really does, and we see it gets quite forceful at times, he's forcing a product out of Dora. So, the, so she's not answering him back. So there's something dropping that he's forcing out that drops down here. And, and what he wants from Dora is not what she thinks and feels, but he wants the product that verifies his theory. Uh, and so, and, and that's part of, if you want a common denominator of, of his aggression, for want of a better word, it's, it's whenever Dora is trying to drift, uh, trying to do something other than deliver back to him proof that his theories are, are correct. The, the most egregious moment of this is when he says that in the unconscious, uh, no means yes, which, which sounds like a nightmarish debate about consent, <laughs> not literally, but in, in terms of, of, of dialogue. If you're gonna use your, your position as master to say that even when someone says no, that's, that's proof that they mean yes, so then there's, there's literally nothing you can't inscribe uh, on, on the body, which is, which is why I think Dora was, had she, her leaving was quite a, a, a courageous act. Uh, and, and it speaks to how well she tried to figure out who she was in, in these sessions with Freud. And she got something out of him, but she definitely didn't get enough. And she felt threatened a lot at, at the way he was trying to 
a position her. So, so the idea here is that Freud talks to Dora, forces a product out of her, which comes back to Freud. So Freud is looking for satisfaction of his own theory. So, so, uh, so the pressuring Dora, out of that pressure comes this product, and then and Freud is only happy. This is this is the only line that Freud is paying attention to. He doesn't really give Dora status as a speaking subject. He only gives her status as uh, an exemplar of his theories. So, so one of the problems with that is, is this, this splits. Uh, part of what Dora says returns to him as product. The parts that Dora is talking about that cannot be converted into product by Freud will we'll move over to here as um, I, I'm next to the split S, I want you to put the word truth. Uh, so there, there's an, there is a denied and suppressed element of Dora's responses to Freud that take up a position where in, 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 that, in a zone where Freud does not want to understand himself. So the reason, so every subject is split is something we'll talk more about, but all of us are split between who we are in language and what else we are apart from language. Uh, but typically in order to be culturally intelligible to have a mobile that we can stabilize, we emphasize who we are in language. That theoretically that's where the unconscious comes from. The unconscious is those things that don't fit into the way you've emerged into an awareness of yourself within language. And whatever doesn't fit within language, whatever, can't, whatever part of the world can't be contained by the words that, that construct you uh, will be denied, but it won't go away. It, it will then haunt the contours of the cultural intelligibility that you formulated with language in the first place. And that haunting actually becomes a necessary part of, 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 of body construction. So it's, it's not even just a negative, like, well, what if we could get rid of, uh, of anything that the language didn't cover? According to Lacan, that would, that's essentially psychosis. That's, that's an inability <clears throat> to conceive yourself in language, which then becomes an inability to be culturally intelligible. Um, let's, let's look at some other... Con, uh, contours here. I thought the way he wrote that Dora viewed her father as a role model and factored that into his uh, uh, analysis of, of her was uh, really interesting. T tell us that, Asia, because we're beating up on Freud quite a bit, and 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 he may not have gotten everything wrong. What was your what was your thought about uh, that the father was a role model for Dora? Um, I just thought that the way he viewed her entire life in uh, like as a whole rather than just analyzing each specific part and cherry picking what he wanted in terms of like psychoanalyzing her. Like I thought that was interesting because like modern um, psychologists don't really do that as much. Like mm -hmm. they factor in um, like specific symptoms and specific life events, but not really like how this person viewed their family or their, the people around them and such and such, you know, sort of like that. Yeah, well, I think, uh... I mean, the word, the term role model, I, it, it's all in the term, right? You pick somebody and they model for you uh, a, a possible way of, of being. Now, not so much, obviously not that Dora, Dora's father wants Dora to be a father, but, but Dora's father wants her to be a daughter. And that she, so she looks to the father as a role model, what is a daughter? And, uh, you know, th this concept of hysteria, which initially is highly feminized, and I mentioned this in my, my intro remarks, um, hysteria really is the gaps in your own narrative, functional gaps that occur when, whenever language fails to cover the entirety of your experiential understanding of yourself. So those times where you fall, where you pause, or you say, um, or, or, or there's a slip Freudian slip. The, these are moments where language is, where, where the, the, um, the baldness, the areas that language is, cannot cover us begin to uh, uh, appear. And, and in general, in order to stabilize the mobile of, of self-perception of the body, we ourselves try and slough over 
areas where, where the verbal breaks down. Um, so the, and Freud may, I think may have had a point at this point, on this level at least, the, psycho and the, the psychoanalyst is, is trying to hear the silences in the gaps between and among the words. Uh, now Freud, I think occasionally exploits that by saying what Dora meant much too much. And the, and the problem with noticing that people have gaps in their story, and this is something Freud got a little better about in later case studies. We don't have time to, to do a whole thing on, on Freud. And he's trying to get better even in the Dora case because half of, half of this Dora case is footnotes that he wrote over the next four, five years before he publishes because he knew something was wrong. He couldn't totally figure it out, but he knew he'd blown it somehow with Dora. And he was struggling to not let go of his theories, but also wondering what's wrong with my theories. So th that is something Freud tried to do with varying degrees of success and, and failure. Um, and in this case, what he learned uh, it is the relationship between a patient and a psychoanalyst in, in at least the way Freud was developing psychoanalysis. The most, the tool that you're using in that relationship is transference and counter-transference. So the difference between a therapist and your best friend even though lots of best friends claim to be our therapist. Um, but the, the, the difference is that a therapist is trained and paid to notice who you are mistaking him or her for. And, and, in, and if you don't mistake your therapist for somebody, then there's nothing therapeutic going on. It's because one of the ways we identify with people that we meet that we haven't met yet is, is based on people we have. So going back to the role model concept of would it, whether whether we're talking, about, we'll stick with heterosexuality for the moment. But if what's the relationship of a boy to a mother and a man to a lover? What's the relationship of a girl to a father and and a, and a woman to a lover? There is there there is an element of transference in relationship. That doesn't mean that you're deluded or or, or that you're hallucinating who this other person is. It's just identification is the accrual of all of the identifications in your life. Why are you more attracted, not necessarily sexually, but in any way, why are you more attracted to, to person A than person B? It has something to do with, with the accrual of your identifications, which, which is individual. And uh, what Freud totally did not even know yet with the door thing, which the con talks about a lot more, is what, what Freud called counter-transference. The, the, the therapists are not immune to transference. And clearly Freud saw Dora as a daughter too. Uh, and Dora probably saw him as another potential father figure. And, and I think her patience with Dora initial, sorry, Dora's initial patience with Freud was partly based on he allows a little more of my reality than my father does. And I, and I think as she began to see more and more that yes, that was true, but Freud wasn't gonna let it interfere with his diagnosis that she finally said, well, I guess we're done. I guess we've done as much here as, as I can possibly find of, uh, of any use. And, uh, and you'll see when I, when I post the second half of this for next week that, the first thing Dora did when she went back to see Herr K and his wife after they lost a child is, is uh, she said, you know, was I right about what was going on? They, they said, yeah, you were essentially. So she went back to Freud and said she'd be interested in talking some more and Freud declined, uh, said that he thought that, that uh, she wasn't sincere somehow. Was that, so it was another kind of a failing. It, it made it clear that Dora came back to Freud saying, can we go back to my reality checking and, and work through this some more? Freud's theory wouldn't really allow that. And, and so he wasn't, uh, he wasn't able to, to take up that uh, challenge. Um, let me look at another, some more comments. I found the ending interesting with Dora experiencing homosexual tendencies, but it seemed like it was just quickly added in there to fulfill his views within psychosexual development and describing it uh, 
almost uh, as a phase. I think that's absolutely this. You're right about that, uh, Alessia. Uh, and, and I'm not sure I'm whether I'm talking about the part of door I've already printed or not, but you may have already read more here. Um, can, can you, can, Alessia, can you uh, elaborate on what you noticed? Because I, I think it's important because it gets to this, it gets to sexual orientation, which we haven't spoken of yet in this, in this open class. And I, and I think it's gonna be a, an important issue of how the body gets structured. Because so far we've been talking about the heterosexual paradigm and matrix, which is obviously the dominant matrix. Um, but the, how do you stabilize the desires of the body? That, that is the other challenge, part of this mobile. And the, and the culture has vested interests in, in directing um, legitimate and illegitimate desire. And obviously in Freud's time in 1900, homosexuality was stigmatized um, uh, severely. It was seen as a perversion. In fact, it was listed as a perversion for, for years going into the 50s. And we're gonna wanna look at that too. Like how does the boundary between normal and perverse, how does that get infiltrated by social regulation? Uh, if, if it once was perverted to be gay and now it's, quote, not, what, what changed? Uh, it, not, not, the, not the action or the orientation, uh, but the, the, the recognition uh, of, a, of a need to stop imposing a social regulation uh, that forbade um, uh, and, and made illegitimate inconvenient desires. So Oscar Wilde's uh, lover uh, famously referred to, well, we didn't have the word gay or homosexual in the time of Oscar Wilde, but he referred to it as the, the love that dare not speak its name, which gets back to body and, and language. Uh, that to be homosexual at the turn of the century is to have a feeling that you were not allowed to verbalize and that you were not allowed to perform. Uh, and to the extent that you did so, or even were inclined to do so, uh, there was something wrong with you. It was, it was unnatural. Uh, it's, but, uh, it's ironic because Freud is the one who came up with the insistence that children, as he so charmingly put it, are polymorphously perverse. Uh, where he's by which he meant I don't the, not that all children are little perverse but that children's bodies are unmapped uh, they they they're not heterosexual strictly speaking or homosexual strictly or bisexual or trans or or any anything on the spectrum that we uh, uh, are able to speak of more today than than in the past uh, the, the idea it's not so much that. You know, we're born with the proper sexual orientation, and then and then we stigmatize people who don't, who, who were born wrong. Um, it's that the body is born with, with, with as a sensible entity, um, and and then it it begins to try. We we begin to try and have some understanding of. Uh, of how desires from that are it, that are stimulated by the outside world, how do we how do we stabilize those? Um, and in Dora's case, she seems to have been quote unquote in love with with Mrs. K. He he has this odd quote where she ref, she once referred to Mrs. K's adorable white body. He tries to make something of that. Uh, it's it's unclear. We probably don't have enough information. I mean, Dora did go on to get married and had a child. Not that that proves one thing or another. Um, but he does seem to concede in the footnotes after the case is over that he missed that too. That, that there was, uh, but I think the reason he missed the depth of the importance of Mrs. K to, to Dora is that he didn't also was missing the importance of, of mother figures to Dora. So it wouldn't necessarily be, Mrs. K is a potential sexual partner for Dora, but also that she was a mother substitute. Um, her own mother, for various reasons, was too 
involved in, in her own painful compensations to, to be there for Dora. Mrs. K seemed to be there. And I, and I think for I'd missed how, what a, the worst betrayal was that Mrs. K told her husband that she had been looking at sort of anatomical books with Dora. And, and, uh, and the husband took this as an example in defending himself to Dora's father that, no, I haven't done anything inappropriate with Dora, but she's been reading these books about sexuality. And so it just, it was too much for her and it affected her imagination. And Dora's very clear with Freud. He doesn't spend enough time on this. It, he, she focuses on the fact that Herr K got that information from Mrs. K, which for Dora was a betrayal. Like she had a relationship with Mrs. K. And then, and then when, it, when this, this uh, assault, if you will, on Dora came out, Mrs. K gave information to Herr K that, that allowed her side of the story to be canceled. And it wasn't that Herr K denied it, because that's almost to be expected. It's that Mrs. K colluded with Herr K to make the denial possible, uh, which does, does address what was Mrs. K getting out of it and, and what was her secondary gain. So it's, you know, it's, 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 I mean, sympathy is a word that comes to mind when I think of Dora going from the age of 14 to 18, constantly trying to build a loving relationship with numerous adults. And every single time she got betrayed. Uh, I mean, she did, Herr K was, was, was a charming uncle figure to her for, gave her presents every day, gave her flowers every day. Uh, she, she leaned into that relationship until it became sexual and, and really identified itself as, as a grooming. Uh, Mrs. K had long talks with her, appreciated how much Dora took care of the children. Uh, her father also appreciated how much he took care of the children until Dora began to feel like, but that was just so that he had access to Mrs. K. And, and so she was a glorified babysitter uh, being, being asked to, to make the affair possible. Um, okay, let me, let me push on. Uh, unless you wanna add something, Alessia, because I've been embroidering your comment. What, what, are you, what am I getting right or wrong? Um, I agree with basically all that you said. Um, I also think that um, it's interesting in her position where her mom is viewed as someone who's um, very domestic and almost almost neurotically so with cleaning. But, but she, Dora's put into this position where she's almost fulfilling the same roles just for different reasoning. I just found that interesting. Uh, yeah, say, say that again now. What's Because that was a sort of Dora and her mother relationship. How were you yes. seeing that? Uh, just in like um, being congratulated and lauded on her child care, um, just ah. kind of fulfilling her roles in almost a motherly way. Mm -hmm. But um, the opposition is that her mom does similar things, but on top that um, Dora is fulfilling the means for which her father can um, continue his affair. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost like that distinction makes Dora's behavior more um, uh, like preferable as opposed to her mother's. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's well put. I, uh, which allows me to bring up another structural issue to bear in mind with both in your prompt and in this class and that is how much a reward demerit system enforces and reinforces and even punishes uh, our relationship to discourse this, this is this gets a little bit into the, the area of Foucault whom, whom, you, uh, whom you may know a little bit but in his book discipline and punish uh, he he talks a lot about how discipline and punishment um, regulate the contours of, of self-awareness. He, he, he does talk about the body. In fact, he has a term called biopower and he has it and another term that's come out of Foucauldian the theory is biopolitics. How is, and, and 
I don't want to get into too big a distraction at the moment, but COVID-19 is, is, is a shocking Foucauldian example of biopolitics and biopower. Wherever you are on the issue of vaccinating, um, you can, the state apparatus is, and the body and disease and the medical profession, I, I, I've never seen, to me at least, have never been so exposed as, as they have been with a pandemic. Um, the Spanish flu was essentially a pandemic, but that was practically pre-media. So this, this pandemic uh, has been playing out in, in the world of the internet and, and what the, the virus, uh, which has no politics, it, it makes it easier for, for want of a better word, to see how politicized, how, how necessary the body is for, for the politicization um, of, of discourse. Because the virus, by by any account, COVID does not the virus does not have politics. So you have no. It's it's much easier to see that everything that has come out of the debate over vaccines and COVID is political, um, and it and it does kind of illustrate Foucault's biopolitics. It politics, the politicization of discourse will turn to the body for an attempt to legitimate itself. So in addition to everything else, the body is, is an enormously contested site for legitimation. And, and you, I mean, you can just listen to Fox News or CNN for two minutes and you will see the body, be a contested site of, of, of political legitimation. Because politics in its essence is neither legitimate nor illegitimate to, except to the extent that it could be made to appear so. And, and, the, and the body, because of its status as presumably essentialist, that, 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 it's, that the body too is not political. And, and the body isn't political, but it's always politicized. And, and in that sense, takes its place in, uh, in, in political discourse. Um, Carlene, yeah, you're right. You're, you're certainly right to think of Lolita. Is, uh, is that a novel you, how did you come upon that novel? Was it in other classes or your own reading? If you're still out there, Carlene? No, oh, no, uh, I just read it casually. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. <laughs> well, we, I, I, I'll probably be looking at Kubrick's movie version of Lolita. The, the, I, I would love to do the novel itself, but I'm trying to do multiple discourses in here and it's hard to find time. I don't want to just throw a 300 page novel at you guys that I can't cover, but Lolita, Kubrick's Lolita um, is, if any of you guys know it, but, but one, of the, one of the things that comes out in Lolita, because it's a first person narration by Humbert Humbert, who, who is the groomer and the abuser of Lolita, uh, is we see in a much, much more, um, uh, what negative way, for want of a better word, that, that Humbert is split too. He's a split subject. I mean, Nabokov is kind of clear by calling him Humbert Humbert. It, it's like there's a, there's a single Humbert, but he's split down the middle. There's the elegant European Humbert uh, and there's the pedophile Humbert. And they try, in a sense, hum, those two Humberts uh, try and not be in communication with one another, which is why there's another character in the novel, uh, Quilty. Do you remember, do you remember Quilty, Carlene? Yes, I do. Yeah. So, do, do, do you remember? The, the, how would you describe the 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 funk, the relationship between Humbert and Quilty? And, and I'll help you out with that if you don't remember. <laughs> um. Well, they're, they're in a way they're both. Um, wanting to kind of exhibit control over like uh, this like young female character. Yeah. Um, qu like Quilty is kind of like the antithesis to uh, Humbert Humbert, but at the same time, he's not like a, a hero character also. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, what I was going to suggest, and, and, and I know not everyone's read the novel, so I'll, I'll just, but it's, is it, it's the way it's narrated. It's not always clear that Quilty even exists. Uh, he's an alter ego to, to Humber. It, it seems that Quilty is the, is the self-loathed side of, of Humber because he, you know, he's pornographic, he's vulgar, he's alcoholic, he's, uh, 
he, he's, he's a kind of our, our, our sense of the, the worst possible uh, formulation of a, of a pedophile, of a, a predator and, and so on. And it seems that it, it, in a way Quilty seems split. And I don't wanna say that Freud is split between Humbert and Quilty, but, in a, but we're all split. And in a way, Freud's not a, I wouldn't call him a pedophile or a sexual predator, but there's a, there is the sophisticated Freud who is trying to develop his, his theories. And, and then there's that Freud that Freud doesn't want to recognize uh, that also finds Dora annoying. And, and he does admit later that, he, that possibly Dora was configuring him as Herr K in, in the transference. But something he barely touches on is to what extent was he identifying with Herr K? Because that becomes a bit, a bit. Because one of the one of the things I, when I first read Dora a million years ago, you know, in in university and so on, I couldn't figure out how could Freud possibly take the take up the cause of Herr K. And the way Freud writes this case study, there's there's really nothing. There's no traction to figure out. He seems too smart to just assume that Herr K has a good idea, which is why not um, groom this fourteen year old. But there's, a, there's clues in there that, that while Freud has no intention of grooming Dora, he can't help um, identifying the cause of, of Herr K. And that's a real problem for, uh, for the analysis. And we'll, we're going to see a lot of split subjects in this class, a lot of alter egos. Uh, we'll see them in Kafka. And, and uh, in fact, the movie you're going to be seeing next week uh, is the, the Three Faces of Eve uh, will show, will, is in a movie of, about a woman who is seen as having um, what we used to call split personality and now is called dissociated identity uh, syndrome. The idea of a possibility that somebody becomes, is capable of performing as two or three different people and those personas may not be in contact with one another. That's, so the, the movie, the, the Three Faces of Eve is, presumably based on a case study. And, uh, and so there's a psychiatrist again, and you're gonna walk, walk through the, and Joan, uh, Joan Fontaine, I, I, I just skipped on the, on the actress, although she won an Academy Award that year for this performance. And she, she seems to be three different women. What, what will, so partly what you're getting is this battle over all of us seem to want to, or we're, or we're encouraged to paper over the split in our own subject position. And one way to paper over the split in your own subject position is how you position other people. So um, Freud positions Dora to cover, to, to paper over his own split. Humbert Humbert positions Lolita to, to paper over his own split. And the psychiatrist in Three Faces of Eve positions E to, to cover over uh, gaps in, in the masculine performance and the masculine self-perception. Now, this was a movie made in the 1950s. So the psychiatrist is going to be allowed to be the, the master or what Lacan calls the subject presumed to know. A, a, and with the emphasis on the word presumed. So uh, Lee J. Cobb plays this psychiatrist who's in a way that's reminiscent of Dora he sees his goal as to pick the, you know, which of, how can he fold the other two Eves, the other two faces of Eve, if you will, into a single personality so, and, that, and so that she can be, quote, cured. Uh, and the movie will show him, quote, unquote, doing that. But you'll see the same, if we read it against the grain, this being 2022, not 1950, uh, we'll see the same structurings um, and, and the same presumptions on his part. Uh, we can also see that Eve's splitting among three different women makes sense in terms of the cultural pressures she comes under because predictably one of her faces is, is, a, is a mousy oppressed housewife. Uh, another persona is, 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 is it's a highly sexualized a uh, woman who doesn't feel like she's married at all. And a, and a third is a, is a terrified child. And those, those are the three faces that we're gonna see in this 
uh, movie. And what we're what we're sort of allowed to see is it's like a psychiatrist masterfully folds in the the at least what's pronounced as the hypersexual Eve and the terrified child of Eve, and it folds them both into the mousy housewife, which allows finally. Uh, her name is actually Jane, it, it, to emerge as a, as a culturally intelligible, unified uh, woman. And, and the other two personalities, quote unquote, disappear in, in two. Uh, so we're going to see this a lot, like where aber quote, supposed aberrations and splits, the, the, the definition of the cure is to fold in those aberrations and splits so that they're no longer um, visibly operational, uh, which often just means they reemerge as symptoms. Because arguably having different personalities, that's the emergence of a symptom. And a symptom is a, is a pre-articulate reality that haunts the, uh, the, the substance of our articulated reality. So symptoms by definition are pre-articulate. If, if you can speak what the symptom represents, the symptom no longer has to represent. And, and to some degree, Freud thought that's what he was should be trying to do is get people to articulate, give words to their symptoms so the symptom can dissipate because the, the function of the symptom is to persist. And, and, and Dora almost becomes Freud's symptom. I mean, I, in fact, I think you could even say that is it Dora persists in a way that Freud cannot translate into his theory. There are, there are elements of Dora that persist and he keeps on trying and he feels like given more time, he'll succeed. I don't know that that's true at all, but Dora takes a decision out of his hands by saying, this is our last meeting. And then he puts a lot of emphasis on, I can't really be faulted for, for failing to cure her because she left the treatment before the treatment had a chance to resolve itself. But, but according to whom had, had the, did the treatment not get a chance? Um, to resolve it. So uh, My Dark Vanessa was, it? yeah, I, I haven't actually read it, but I have heard of it. It's a, is it. Is it a telling from in the voice of Lolita? Is that, is that how that works, Lilana? Sorry, still um, it's, it's, um, sorry, yeah, no, it's not like, it's like, it's kind of like Lolita, but it's from her, like her point of view and it's, um, I don't know. It's it's just a really good novel about how she like um goes from like loving him and into like realizing that it's like oh I, I'm being you know like this isn't good. This isn't a great mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it occurred. I mean, there's so many books that would be would would could find a place in this course. It's, it's, it's totally overwhelming. And that that I remember at some point, not not this recent, not recently, but I had thought, like, well, what. Can I, should I, could I do something like My Dark Vanessa, but then I would, I would need to do Lolita and then I'm doing the Nabokov seminar. So I, I struggle with my syllabus here, to be honest, where I'm, I want it to be multifactorial uh, and there, but there are so many things that I would love to, to include. You will notice that from time to time, I, I'll offer you guys some extra credit where I'll, I'll put something in the discussion. It's not a prompt and you don't have to do it. Um, but if you do it, you can get an extra point on on the midterm or the final, um, and something like my dark Vanessa could show up at, at, in an extra credit model. Or um, so so keep an eye out uh, for those. Um, there's no penalty for for not doing them, but it's a, it's a chance to shore things up if if you do. And it's and it's I guess it's my attempt to ease my frustration that I can't always present all the material to you guys that I would like to but but i don't really want to do that um to the at the expense of being able to to follow the class um let's let's go on with because there's some other interesting comments here uh from emily uh, the the way he dismissively speaks of her privacy concerns bothered me from the beginning you know that's a good point which i understand would be different to those today but it's so disrespectful to dora i i i agree I, and I, it's hard to take to put yourself back in 1900 Vienna, although certain writers have. Uh, there is a book called Freud's Vienna, which is pretty fascinating read 
about what was, and one thing that comes out when you read the book, Freud's Vienna is everybody, you know, Freud is, is his clientele is, is Jewish middle-class often recent, you know, first or second generation immigrants from Bohemia or other parts uh, of Europe. Um, and that's true of, of Dora. I mean, before he ever saw Dora, he treated Dora's father for what, what turned out to be effects of, uh, of having earlier contracted syphilis before his marriage. So that was before he ever met Dora. In fact, one reason the father brought Dora to Freud is he already, that Freud had helped him deal with this outbreak of syphilis, which it would seem that he had passed on to his wife, which was not, not, as, not as unusual as one might think, which would explain more of why the wife has what Freud claims is housewife psychosis, why she's obsessed with cleaning. I mean, if, if you were given an STD by your husband, which probably also is not being talked about. Uh, and, and Freud insists on seeing Dora's mother's cleaning as, as an act of passive aggression. Like she, she cleans the house in order to make everybody uncomfortable. Like people don't, that, they can't even stay there. And she keeps all the windows open. I mean, she's symptomatic too, but, in, in it's, but Freud's not interested in reading the symptoms um, that, that she's expressing her, her frustration and rage uh, uh, with, uh, with with her her husband so all of that occurs before the father and and freud so freud knows everybody he knew he knew the aunt of dora he and he brings it up every now and then but it was, it was a very um you know if you read the case study it sounds like random but but it's a highly self-selected uh clientele and going back to um the earlier comment about his his dora being groomed as many of you may know, and this is really controversial, for the, in the early part of Freud's writings, uh, he's, he felt that hysteria in women very commonly was a result of domestic sexual abuse. And then, then when he began to just like see that virtually every woman brought to him, every often 14, 18, 20, all appeared to have been abused by a father, by an uncle, by somebody, he backtracked, he backed away from the, from the literalness, uh, 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 the initial literalness of his claim and said, well, whether you are abused or not, uh, there's, a, there's a degree to which women can feel abuse. And this, this is highly, obviously a highly controversial, did Freud step back? Because it's not, you know, and you could say, well, I don't know if you took a random sample of young women, is it likely they were all sexually abused? Well, the statistics would suggest no, but this is a self-selected group. These are highly intelligent women in a middle-class family environment, many of whom were being denied education that their brothers were being afforded. They were, they were expected to, they were being pushed into these roles and they were, and their intelligence was, was being ignored. Um, and, and so it would it be less surprising if actual sexual abuse was virtually a common denominator in in the women that Freud saw. And then and we have to then we have to remember that psychoanalysis is founded on a self-selected group of middle class Jewish adolescent women who were at the very least being dominated by overbearing, tone deaf fathers and angry, unavailable mothers. I mean that's a highly that's a highly structured, uh, and and any statistician would 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 immediately say that you know the the uh, the con absolute conclusions are very dangerous to draw from such a narrow uh, from such narrow scope. Um, and uh, yes, Jennifer, uh, your Judith Butler's gender trouble uh, is one. It was it was one of her first books, and the first chapter. I might, perhaps I may even post something from her. She's she's not an easy read, but she's definitely readable with 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 some patience. Um, and then her second body, uh, sorry, her second book was actually called Bodies That Matter, and and also is. Uh, in fact, I was trying to I was going to get to a point that she talks about in Bodies That Matter quite a bit, and that is that her idea of gender performance is that it's a masquerade of essentialism constructed from repetition and citation. 
and this may have, this this seems relevant to to the work I'm asking you to do with the uh, you know, with the Cosmo uh, covers. In other words, gender performance masquerades as essential as essentialism. So to be feminine, to perform as feminine makes it appear that you are essentially a woman. To perform as as masculine suggests you're essentially a man. There is no essence here. What what Butler points out. And she's working off Lacan and Foucault, but what 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 she articulates uh, is that there is no there there. Femininity uh, operates. Um, let me move this over again because I seem to have a, a halo. Um, <laughs> that's undeserved. Um, like that. Yeah, I'll try that. And so, in fact, what it really is is feminine gender performance, and let's stick, stick with Cosmo for a moment. It works on citation. So every cover of Cosmo where you have a woman who's in a posture, who's wearing a dress, or, and, and then the discourse that surrounds the woman, all of this mimics essentialism, but it's really just the result of a repetitive citation. And, there, and the citations are circular. Uh, the, the, in other words, there's, there's no foundational truth being cited. The citations are citations of citations. And, that, and so the, rep the repetition of citation becomes, uh, is what generates the illusion of essentiality. And, and, and it, so the very fact of Cosmo magazine at all, the fact that for month after month, for decades, this, a woman has been appearing on the cover surrounded by discourse is, is a great illustration of, of what Butler tries to bring forward is that Cosmo magazines present the essential woman through a gender performance that legitimates itself by citing other Cosmo covers, which cite other Cosmo covers. <clears throat> there is no foundational uh, Cosmo cover. So you get, you get lost in citations. Um, and, and this is another way that the body is allowed to become culturally intelligible not as a not as an essence but it but it masquerades as an essence and and then it's in then it's policed with rewards and demerits um, that performing the gender quote unquote better leads to reward and failing to perform the gender adequately leads to demerits and uh, so I, I I made I made a point of talking about um, the the article that's illust that's mentioned on the cover of the Cosmo that I was talking about, you know, where it says, "So you ate a cupcake." Quick, quick ways to burn it off. Y you can see the reward demerit system built into that loaded phrase. Uh, first, you're interpolated; you're you're called out as "So you ate a cupcake," and the cupcake is an attempt to be sort of whimsical about it. Um, the subtext of so you ate a cupcake, quick ways to burn it off, is that weight control is an essential element of gender performance. Uh, th th there's a presumption of a certain body shape for a more rather than less successful uh, performance of gender, whether it's the, the dresses, uh, the kind of body that, that, that fits in the kind of dresses that are uh, are designed so so in in a kind of in a in what comes across as playful there is something kind of ominous so you ate a cupcake quick ways to burn it off it, it, it's it's trying to say like who cares no big deal you ate a cupcake but but also embedded in that is you better do something about it and i won't accuse that headline of being an encouragement toward bulimia but analyzed enough, it could be, you know, so you ate a cupcake, you get rid of it. Quick ways to burn it off. Could, could one of those quick ways be to induce vomiting in the high school bathroom? Yeah, that would be the, one of the quicker ways. Now, the, the article's not going to suggest that. Um, but when you look at anorexia nervosa or, or bulimia, uh, there, is a, there is a line that can be drawn because the, the way that 
headline of the article is phrased, um, it's a false dilemma. If you eat a cupcake, you have to burn it off. Uh, and, and, and left unsaid is, uh, and what if I don't? But what, what, that, what the unsaid there is, then you will fall away from the ideal performance of, uh, of femininity. And so this is, this is another form of, uh, of policing. It, it, it involves you know, guilt and, and self-image uh, and, and self-confidence. Hard to, hard to imagine the same headline on the, uh, on the cover of GQ. You know, so you, to, to, would you say that to the, must, the, the guy who's curling iron on the cover of GQ, so you ate a cupcake? Quick ways to burn it off. Now you might ha you'll have equivalents. There's a lot of pressure on men to have six pack abs and all that stuff, but it will get phrased uh, very very differently. And that that's something we'll be kind of keeping an eye on um, throughout the course. Um, and yeah, Jennifer, can you tell us a little more what you mean? Because I think I've hinted at this but men are seen as the default. What, what's your sense of that from, from your reading? Oh, um, I can't remember exactly what you were talking about, mm -hmm. but um, I was thinking more uh, along the lines of in medical issues and like science issues and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. where, and even just in general that because men are seen as like the default human, mm -hmm. they, um, medicine, um, any sort of like car test driving, even mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. don't, they do their, the test dummies are average size for men. They're not the average size for women, even though women make up half the population, they mm -hmm. don't use female crash test dummies. Mm -hmm. So and mm -hmm. they build cars around a male driver. That's interesting. Yeah. And in medical testing, men are seen as the default so that they'll have dosage limits written on the bottles, but the studies didn't involve women. Oh, that, that's, it is yeah. proven that women um, metabolize uh, drugs at a different rate than men do yep. because of our physio because of our body yeah so that's that's a, yeah, that's a that's a really good point i i'm, I'm glad you uh, brought that up because what follows from that too is that then then other theoretically empirical realities of a woman's body like menstruation also uh become um aberrant in, in i mean no one would at least these days no one would put it that way but clearly the the issues around menstruation multiply very rapidly that it, that it makes theoretically it's it, it, back when i was growing up there were people would men would casually say well women can't be president because they uh, have because they have menstrual pains and they're moody and and so they can't be ex, uh they can't be trusted with it's like i have nothing against women it's just they menstruate you know it's that it's a way to duck you know misogyny it uh and, and make it seem reasonable and, and part of that is because menstruation if i'm if i'm extrapolating for what you've just uh said it, it's it's not a def there's not there's not in the def it's not in the default mode um and and then when we could extend that to any other any number of other experiences of, of a of a female body uh, obviously pregnancy and birth and breastfeeding and uh all of these things are we seem to have made progress. I, I'm, I'm always a little suspicious, like breastfeeding in public, for instance, was, uh, I, I grew up watching this be, I mean, I grew up, everybody bottle fed. There, there was in the sixties and seventies, um, how, how could a woman's body make a better milk than science? Uh, no one even seriously questioned it. Um, and, and so to, to breastfeed and not bottle feed was seen as not doing the best for your child. Now, through the 90s, that, that, that changed and, and even the formula companies had to, had to back off a bit and say, okay, we're a supplement. Um, you know, you can move on to formula, but breastfeed if you can. And, and, and I watched the discourse shift uh, over the years. Um, but it's a it's another example of 
the things that a female body does that a male body doesn't have, have a long history of being outside the, the dominant discourse. I, I, I perhaps I'm just, you know, paraphrasing what you already said. Does that, does that, uh, is that a fair kind of extrapolation from what you were bringing up? Yeah. And it's, it's funny how that they said that even when Hillary Clinton was mm -hmm. running for president, that, oh no, she'll get her period and she'll be all over. And then all the women were like, she's past the age of menopause. By the way, yeah. Period anymore, either yeah. way. Yeah. And, and of course, even when you, even when you get forced into that position of, of, you know, she's not menstruating anymore, you, you also need to check yourself and say, and by the way, it doesn't matter, you know, you, uh, you can, otherwise you, you don't want to uh, inadvertently reinforce like, well, if we do get a woman candidate who's not men, because then the other way you can't win anyway, because then they shift to menopause uh, as the, well, you can't have a president who's having hot flashes. So, so you can't win, right. Uh, it, when you, when you've decided that there, there there is a presumed essentialness of the female body that unfits it uh, across the board, like forget this woman or that woman, but the female body uh, is can never be uh, as good, quote unquote, as uh, as as the male body, and even and even though this has gotten challenged on on an, on any number of fronts. Uh, it, but, and I think this is also the problem with viewing the woman's body uh, as a subject of knowledge, as a, sorry, as an object of knowledge. Uh, so many, for so many years, and, and there's been pushback, but the people defining what a woman's body was and how it affected the experience of being a woman, we're, we're all men. And obviously for it is, is uh, a, a full on case of that. Uh, I mean, famously, Freud said at one point, he, he, he described the sexuality of women as, quote, the undiscovered continent, which is really kind of disturbing. Like, well, we're supposed to send explorers uh, in, into the female body, um, which, which wasn't as nuts as it sounded, because there, there was a lot of uh, pro-imperial uh, fiction being written by Robert Louis Stevenson and um, uh, other people who, who took, the, took Africa uh, as as female right? and and they and they would depict these adventure stories where men essentially conquered the rivers and streams and mountains and groves and and in every case it's like con they were conquering the woman's body the landscape the imperial gaze of uh, of the colonized landscape was elided with the domestication of uh, of the female body and um, that's, and I think in a way, that's the other thing Dora walked away from. Like, <laughs> I mean, part of what Dora said, but didn't say when she's leaving is, you don't know what you're talking about. I, I mean, literally, like, there's too much you don't know. Like, you talk a lot, and you seem to know a lot, but the problem is you think you know everything, um, and, and you're not listening. Uh, to to information I'm trying to give you that that you need um, and that you're not going to be able to find uh, by yourself. Um, so let's go to, to, to yeah. There is my don't burn your frog skin, which I guess is if those of you had have had me for a ten or, or 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 yeah, mostly a ten, I guess that I won't go through the whole thing right now. But the part of the part of what I hope this course helps you with is, it, it, and I can't even know what this is like for each of you, but to at least be able to recognize un, the unfair stigmatization of aspects of yourself that you have every right to celebrate uh, and, and to be able to recognize uh, when you're being controlled by stigmatization and to refuse it, which isn't easy, but, uh, but you know, how does Dora, I don't, we don't know for sure, but where did she get the strength to walk out on analysis with uh, with Freud, uh, she, we, we, at one point Freud mentions in passing that what she liked in her spare time, she went to women's lectures. It's a fascinating comment. He just drops by the side. But to me, I, I would love to draw that out. Like which women's lectures? Like what, because I, I keep wondering where is the support Dora is getting 
to stand up to one of the most formidable, um, one of the more formidable minds at the turn of the century, Freud. She had to be getting support. It wasn't from the, fa the father or the mother or her care, any of those people. Was it these lectures, at least to, to an extent? And, and her education was not being encouraged or supported. And she went out and sought these lectures. I find that an incredibly important thing that, that Freud relegates to, to literally half a sentence. Um, and one of the things we want to, and oddly enough, we owe this insight a little bit to Freud, but you want to listen to for what's not being said in addition to what's being said. And this is a case where we can psychoanalyze Freud uh, quite a bit. Why did you slough, why did you slough over that? Why do you have no interest in the mother? Uh, uh, you know, can you, what, can, can you explain your gaps and absences? You're so specific uh, with Dora's. Um, so did we go over the syllabus yet? Sorry, I joined the call. I, I wanna know in particular midterm and finals. Yeah, midterms are all online, uh, Guan Te Lu. And I, I am gonna uh, post a description of, of the midterm final format. It, it is in this tape recording, which I will post later. So I'll invite you to go listen to the first 20 minutes of this tape. I don't wanna repeat it for everybody here. And if there's still issues, uh, it can come up next week or you can email me directly uh, about that. Uh, also, if this class has any textbooks, all readings are gonna, I believe will be online. I'm, I'm scrounging around to make sure that that is, is the case. But uh, uh, I know at least for now and probably up to the midterm, I'm, I've sourced, I think everything so that I know Three Faces of Eve, I've given you a link that will take you to the movie. I'm posting Dora, I'm gonna be posting Plath uh, for, for next week. Um, and so yeah, my, my goal is to have it all online because no one's going to the bookstore right now. I, the one, one exception is I'm, I'm doing a, um, a post-apocalyptic thriller by a Native American woman um, late in the class. And uh, it's, so I, I should have a look at that because I know it's, I know you can order it through Amazon. I know it's not that expensive, uh, but I might not be able to, that might not be online. A lot of what we're looking at is older Kafka and all the rest of it. So the goal is to have it online, but I should look ahead and make sure Worst case scenario, if I cannot get access to something, uh, we we can either substitute or, or there's plenty of material in, in the class. So it, it pays to, you gotta stay up. I mean, it's partly my teaching style, I guess, but I'm, I'm, I'm very much an in-process thinker, even, even when I've taught a class many times. And theoretically, I've taught this class many times. I used to teach it back with Laura Carney, uh, a professor who retired and we, we taught it together. She was in art history and that was cool. But I, I, no matter how many times I teach a class, even A10 and A11, which I've taught 20, 30 times, I, it never feels to me like I'm teaching the exact same class because of the way I teach, I guess. Uh, I, don't, I don't have pro forma. I don't have PowerPoints. Um, never used them, never will. I, I don't judge people who do, but I I find them incredibly constraining um, and I don't know how to get my thoughts into a PowerPoint anyway. So for better or, or for worse. Um, so if it, the textbooks, Freud also had the belief that everyone was bisexual. It, 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 even as I mentioned uh, earlier, Alessia, even polymorphously sexual, like uh, Freud at least, he doesn't spend a lot of time on this, but he, he does open the door to the, to the possibility that what we call sexual orientation is the end result uh, of a certain sort of Foucauldian mapping of the body. Uh, now, where where your dominant desires might be, whether they whether they might be for same sex or uh, or whether one wants feels like they are really the opposite sex of their anatomy and issues of, of trans, what, whatever those impulses are, they all come under. For uh, the the uh, domination of of social regulation. Now, social regulation can change. It's no longer illegal to be homosexual. There, I, I, for, I guess the states are, are still fighting about this, but gay marriage is is uh, uh, for the most part has been allowed. So, social regulation can change, but even the fact that it can change draws attention to the to the degree to which social regulation is always trying to create 
a body through discourse that it then insists on misrecognizing as the body that was always there. So, so social discourse, social regulation always takes the position that I'm just, I am just explaining what the body is. I'm just explaining what men are, what masculinity is, what men and women are, what marriage is. Uh, uh, and, and, and it can go on from there. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm only describing what's already there, but, and this comes from Derrida, there is always already a construction as soon as you use language to describe anything. Um, and that, that's something to bear in mind throughout this course of, of what is the, uh, what has been disfigured by what has been configured. So you can configure the body, C-O-N, but what's been disfigured in the configuration. And, and that, because that's a line, the contour of the body that, that is extremely uh, mobile, um, moving in different directions, never stable, even though there's a constant social interest in stabilizing body contours, which gets internalized as a personal interest, where we, we feel this impulse to stabilize our body contours, which isn't, isn't coming, strictly speaking, from us. So, to, so to, again, to take a Foucauldian observation here, gender construction, the, the, the teaching of gender performance is always is attempting to generate self-policing. So, because the, the, the least effective way to control or impose power is to, is outside policing, because you, you typically you'll set up reluctant conformity at best. So if someone, if you know you're being policed, and if you know you're being made to do something you don't want and don't believe in because you're not, you don't want to get jailed or you don't want to get uh, abused or, you know, whatever it might be, there, there's something worse. You, you, you come up with a false conformity and that is a very unstable social regulation. The more, more effectively is to self-police. And this is something we're going to pay attention to in this class because the real damage in so many of these impositions of, of, of what the body is, is, is the self-policing. Uh, so issues like bulimia, cutting, anorexia nervosa, these, these are all desperate, um, sim, you know, symptomatic excesses that they're protesting. Um, because if your false conformity is different than self-policing, because self-policing raises a situation where you, you feel inclined to punish yourself for failing. False conformity is you, you do what you're told because the person, because someone's going to make, is going to hurt you if you don't, but you know, that's why you're doing it. Self-policing is much more destructive because you've now decided that this is natural. This is the way you should feel. This is what you should be. And that, and that, that to the degree that you're unable to conform, it's now a personal failure. Um, and, and then that can result in self-punishment. So self-regulation, self-policing, self-punishment are, are much, and this is something Sylvia Plath kind of, you know, brilliantly works through. And, and, and we'll see, and since I don't have the voice of Dora for this class, I, I, uh, and the book on Vanessa sounds interesting, but Plath will also stand in as, uh, as an articulated voice of what it feels to be objectified and, and imposed upon and split and demanded of um, that, that we see in, in Dora. Uh, I think Chris asked the point of, you know, how much of what I'm talking about is the mirror stage. And, and we'll, uh, we will talk uh, more about that, but the, to, just to mention here in, in this box that I showed you um, with the, where the subject addresses the other subject, the, the goal when we address other people is to shore up an ideal image of ourselves to, to a degree. And that's what Lacan meant roughly <laughs> by the mirror stage, that, that we look at the intact body in a mirror reflection. And that mirror can be the gaze of a, of a mother, the gaze of a lover, even the gaze of someone who doesn't like us. They become a mirror. And then we approximate how we are how, how well we are able to be the equivalent of this apparently coordinated image 
in, in, the, in the mirror image. And so a lot of our language is attempts to get other people to see us as we, in a way that approximates our ideal image of ourselves as a coherent entity in, in, this, in, the, in the mirror image. So to some degree, we talk to persuade other people to see us as we wish we could be. That's, that I'm oversimplifying a bit, but in some ways that's not a bad thing to do with Lacan because right, you can go down the rabbit hole pretty fast with, 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 with his elaboration. So, so, but since you brought it up, that's something to, uh, to, to re, I mean, in, in Lacan it draws attention to the triangulation of how we experience our body. So we imagine the gaze of, of others when they look at us. We imagine what do people see when they see me? And gender performance seems to offer a way to control that. Like the other with a big O, let's say, is if we look at a, the current cover of Cosmo, that in a sense, we're getting the latest uh, performance of gender in accordance with the expectations of the gaze of, of the other. I mean, the camera that takes the picture of the woman on the cover of Cosmo is like, is like the big other in, in Lacan's sense of things. So you see women change, obviously, from, from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s. And the latest Cosmo cover girl is a, is a YouTube star. Uh, and I put some of the information about, about her on the, uh, in, in the prompt. It, it's quite an interesting, to me, it's, it's one of the more dramatic shifts because Cosmopolitan is struggling for relevancy. I mean, who, how much do we pay attention to magazines in in the grocery store. I mean, it's changed. Things have changed, and this YouTube star, it is at something Chamberlain. I don't know. You guys will might recognize her name, but but um, she's not on the cover of Cosmo because she's a model that they found. She's on the cover of Cosmo because she has millions of viewers who've listened to her YouTube vlogs about the paradoxes of being a young woman. I mean, uh, she's. In some ways, she's a modern Dora who is uh, uh, pushing back. And Cosmo, in its struggle for relevancy, is simultaneously putting her on the cover of Cosmo, which is an older media form, and then simultaneously la launching a link in, in Cosmo.com that covers her photo shoot, and simultaneously posting what she does all the time, which is her vlogs about what it was like to get up in the morning and go and drive to her Cosmo shoot. So it, it's, it's a, I only recently came upon this, which is why my classes are never the same. And this just happened last year. And I got, I was fascinated with uh, how, the, how the discourse field has, has expanded. And at least um, superficially, it looks like you have finally, you have, you have, the, you have the Cosmo model cover girl speaking at length about who she is apart from being a frozen image on a magazine. Uh, and, and in fact, in her vlog, she says, uh, I think looking at all these magazines made, made me anorexic. Uh, so I'm not sure where this is going but entirely, but it's, it's, it's the discourse struggling. You know, and you have to watch for this. It, it, the discourse is really good at, at appropriating successful protests in order to uh, diminish them. Uh, I mean, in a way we see Freud doing that. He allows Dora's protests, even encourages them, but he has an eye toward how he's going to use these new eruptions, these new defiances of Dora and, and figure out how to weave them back into the point he was trying to make in the first place. Uh, and, and I think he did sort of begin to recognize that later when he, when he wrote up the case study. Uh, let, let me see. It, it, uh, so I'm sorry, I want to catch up on comments. Um, so Freud also, yeah, I, I have shown at length elsewhere at what an early age sexual attraction makes itself felt between parents and children. Freud was one hurting dude, <laughs> to, to be honest. Uh, yeah, and I mean, are we all polymorphously perverse? Is that is that a fancy way to say horny? Possibly, um, in the absolute worst way. Yeah, yeah. You could probably do a small seminar on on, on that uh, on that word alone. Agreed. He's just a lot more overt about um, his perversions. It was almost like it was only okay if Humbert was the one with those uh, perversions. 
Uh, Sharmila, are you reacting to how much Humbert, in a sense, tries to um, uh, if recruit the reader? Uh, because I don't think it's just Lolita getting groomed by the novel. I think what's kind of creepy and fascinating is how Humbert tries to, to get the reader on board. Is that is that where you were going with that thought? Uh, no, I was just saying, um, like when you're reading the novel, it's almost like um, the other person was intentionally made to look bad. Um, their actions are more overt than Humbert's to make it look like it was only okay if Humbert was doing that. Mm -hmm. And and in Lolita too, by the way, he uh, this mistaking of a, 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 well, one thing that got missed, I think, with hysteri so-called hysterical patients, and this all began in the Char in Charcot's clinic, which is where Freud began his training as a medical student. There was a, 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 another doctor named Charcot who ran a clinic up for hysterical women, and he had these famous seminars where uh, where women were brought forward for to the group of all men. And there's there's a painting of it uh, I'll put online for you. And uh, you know, both feminist analyses and, and Judith Butler brings this up too. The, the pressure on the, on, the, on the pathologized woman to perform uh, according to the pathologizing gaze in order to get that gaze's attention. So Butler's point was, you hear these women for various reasons, they had failed their gender performances. They were brought to clinics because they had had nervous breakdowns, quote unquote, and that covered any number of uh, behaviors. They weren't being proper mothers, proper wives, proper women uh, by other people's directives. And they were put into the clinic. Once they were in the clinic, the, the source of power was, was Charcot. And so there was a strong emphasis for them to, in order for them to be culturally legible to Charcot, they had to be, they had to conform to what he viewed literally as hysterical. So how much were women performing hysteria? It, it seems clear there was a degree to which they were, either, either to get out of the clinic, to, to uh, you'll see this with Plath, um, that, that idea where you perform to the expectations of the pathologizing gaze to, it, it, to evade the punishments. That, that that gaze can enforce, it, particularly once you're in, institutionalized or, or, or in some way have come under the, the medical discourse. Um, there, it, it, the frustration of being invisible. And, and I see Dora playing with this, like she brings up two dreams. Well, you see more of this in the second half that I'll, that I'll give you. And one, one gets the feeling that she's bringing Freud a present. I mean, he doesn't see it that way. He seems to just assume that sooner or later she's going to bring in dreams. But honestly, when I read it carefully, I, I, it's like she's uh, she's playing him a little bit too. Like, you know, okay, you're into dreams. Here's and and she's also hoping to make a point. Like, there's a, Dora attempts to give her reading of her own dream, which hardly seems like an outrageous thing to do. It's but it doesn't last very long. Um, she gives an initial interpretation of the dream, and then he tells her what it means. She tells her what the dream means based on how the dream illustrates his theories of the unconscious. Um, so she brings him two dreams. And yeah, some of his analysis is, is, is interesting and maybe even occasionally brilliant, but they're, they're not his dreams. And uh, there's other things Dora wants to explore in, in what are in fact her own dreams. And, just to give you a tip, one of the things he misses over and over again in his view of Dora's dreams is the maternal presence. Uh, it's another instance where he just doesn't see it, but it's there. And, um, uh, you know, this is something I emphasize in my cinema classes that what you see is also what is, is no, not also, but what, what you see is uh, supported by what you don't. Anytime you see anything, there there is correspondingly things that you don't see. So even if you walk into a room and you notice it's a kitchen, and you see walls, and you see a stove, and you see a refrigerator, and then you notice uh, uh, the cookie jar, and you go have a cookie, you know, in order to see the cookie jar and to go have your cookie, you stop seeing 
the rest of the kitchen. Uh, and we do that all the time. We, what's in the frame? What's outside the frame? And we, we tend to suppress the relationship of how what's outside the frame is helping construct and support the frame. And, and that goes with the contours or the framing of, uh, of the body. Um, see what I'm, okay, you guys are doing great in the chat. I got to catch up. <laughs> a YouTuber I watched once said, uh, femme fatales are made to artificially appeal to feminists while not alienating men who objectify women. That's, wow, that's nice. Uh, I, I lecture on film noir a lot and I say something like that, but not exactly the way you formulated it, that um, the, you know, the femme fatale can appeal to women because she demands, she demands the money, she demands the recognition, she is willing to, uh, she's been manipulated and she's now willing to manipulate. And so, so it's clear that she can be a, a strong woman character, but that, but the reason she's, she's at the same, she's also objectified, she's sex, sexual. <clears throat> She's, uh, she makes herself, she, she performs availability for the man that she also wants to get something out of. And, and so that's very, very appealing that for a change, a, a performance of femininity is also making demands. Um, not, and the man, the man doesn't recognize the demands because he's only focused on the performance, on her performance of availability. Um, and anime does this quite a lot. The women come across very childlike, but sexualized. Uh, yeah, that's that that the childlike expression of sexuality from a woman, um, and, and or the encouragement of it, or the presumption of it, it seems also. I mean, it's more than one thing, but it certainly appeases men's insecurities um, because to pose as uh, I don't know in, 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 your, in the presentation of yourself in, in a feminine performance relieves the man of any concern about uh, uh, being called out um, because the, the performance is meant to be reassuring that what you say is true, I will accept because I really don't, I really haven't, I don't have any experience. I haven't learned anything yet. Uh, one gets that impression with Humber that, um, with with you know Lolita's initial interest in him, uh, which is not sexualized, but but that he sexualizes, um, is is because he's married to her mother. Before when the mother dies, he takes the daughter away and 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 abuses his position as as stepfather. But he he, he doesn't want anything to do with the mother. Um, uh, and, and it's, he's, he's attracted to this unscripted, uh, you know, what he calls the nymphette, this, this interval in, in uh, roughly 14 to 18, by the way, which is the, the age of, of Dora going to Freud, uh, where, where a girl emerging into being a woman is, is interested in her own sexuality, but hasn't, doesn't own it at this point. So, because Freud spends a lot of time apologizing or, or, or defending himself for talking about sexual issues with Dora. And he keeps trying to say, I, I, I wanted to know if she knew there were other ways for, for sexual satisfaction to occur. And, and then she said, yes. And he spends an awful lot of time on it. Um, he's trying to say, I'm not humbered. I'm not grooming. I'm not drawing this conversation into the sexual to sexualize Dora. And, and to some degree, I think that's that's true, uh, but Freud also could be, at least pedagogically, he is proving his theory on on young women who who ha don't don't have a counter theory um, uh, at at the point in which they're they're seeing him. Um, so the male gaze is probably prioritized quite a lot. I would say it's it's also a default, really, that's like, like the masculine body. Um, and some, it is something to bear in mind, like who's gazing, who is gazed upon. But in terms of gender performance, femininity is is culturally constructed as a as a performance that we view. And masculinity is performed as an assess, as, as an essence um, that occurs. It's not 
It's not supposed to be performative. Men aren't supposed to perform. That's, that's to be feminine. But masculinity is a performance. It's a performance that requires the performance of femininity to remain oblivious to the degree that it's a performance. And you can, sometimes you can literally see that in the Cosmo articles, like how to get your man to talk about himself, what your man's driving tells you about him, how to compliment your man, how, you know, what your man wishes you would do. There's, there's this kind of repetitive um, part of the success of your performance as feminine will be to make it easier for the man to, to not experience himself as performative. Um, and then Aaron responded, uh, I think female characters are displayed that way because women have been taught that it is bad for them to age and need to remain youthful and small to be attainable. That is if they don't properly fulfill the mother role. And, and I agree with Amrit, that's a good point. It's a great point. Um, on the opposite side, men are allowed to age more gracefully earning titles like silver fox with age while women are consistently being marketed uh, anti-aging youth products. Yes, and, and I'll take a moment, Joyce, to, to, to tie that into the commodification of women's bodies, uh, which, which gets at these last two comments to a certain extent. Women's bodies are seen as an asset on the, on the sexual marketplace. Um, and as an asset, what, what, how, if your body as a woman is an asset, and assets are things that appreciate and depreciate. But once, once the body's put on the market in relation to other assets, other women, if you think of that women being put on this stock exchange, and this is, this is a point that Erica Ray makes, as she has an essay called Women on the Market, which, which I'm drawing from, and, and uh, of course, I, mean, I might share that with you too. But the, the idea that, that um, women are judged in relation to the other women, and, and Erica actually uses the the example of going to a club and the sexiest woman, quote unquote, in the club is going to be an asset assessment that emerges based on who, on all the women in the club. So again, there's no there's no essential value to any of the women. It's it's all a proximal value in relation to the other women around them, which also implicitly encourages women to be competitive with one another because. If, if they're put into this market structure, their own value rises or falls in relationship to the performance of other women. So not, it, it's, it, and then men simply become the purveyors of the, uh, of the stock market. Um, and one of the way, the, the primary way a woman quote unquote depreciates in the mark, sexual marketplace is age. So theoretically you, you lose value as an asset if you're 50 versus 30 or 20. Uh, and it has nothing to do with who you are or, or anything uh, about you. Or, or... So we, we, we'll want to pay attention in this class about systems of valuation. Um, how, how is value imposed on you it, by, by approximation to, to other things? Because it's, it's, it's like the house you live in. Let's say you know this month, the house you live in is worth $500,000 or something. And let's say a few things happen with COVID and who knows what else. Your house could then be worth 600 or it could be worth 400, but it has nothing to do with your house. It's strictly an effect of, uh, of the relational and the proximate in, in, in the real estate market. So the sexual market, the real estate market, the stock market, it's women's bodies that are on the market. And not men's as, as a rule. I mean, sometimes this seems to change a little because he, but in, by and large, men, uh, they shop in the market. They're not in the market. They're, they're, they're the consumers. And, and so they, they can be the silver fox. Uh, and, and somehow their own aging, because they're not strictly speaking, their value is not seen as being generated by, by the value of them, their bodies as, as assets. Uh, I don't know, does that, Joyce, does that elaborate kind of where you were going with this? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, thank you. Yeah, sure. I, I, I just don't, I don't want to fall into the Freud trap and start telling you people what you're saying, like what you're really saying. <laughs> um, so let's see, that reminds me of the dreaded 1,000-year-old, uh, uh, the appeal to Western audience since East Asian women tend to be fetishized, yeah. And what is, I'm sorry, what is the 1,000-year-old child trope? Uh, 
uh, Nate, is it Nathan? If you're there. Or the 1,000 year old male. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, could you repeat what you're saying? Yeah, I, I, it's, I haven't heard of that trope exactly. Is that a trope in anime, the 1,000 year old child? Um, yeah, so oftentimes in anime, there will be a uh, character, most likely female, who is drawn as a child, but they the characters will say, oh, this character is a thousand years old, or they're just like really old. Um, so it's okay that we put them in these compromising situations because they're not a child, they're a thousand years old. Wow, okay. That's, that's a remarkable. Because I, I, I have heard of this, 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 idea of age play, uh, uh, particularly in, in on so-called, well, pornographic websites where it's illegal to, to present 18 year old, anyone under 18, any woman under 18. Right now there's this very strange performative gray area where 18 year old women can, can um, role play. And, and I don't think, and I don't, legally, I don't think people know what to do yet with this. What, what happens when an 18 year old role plays as 10? Is, isn't that child pornography? On, on one level, it would seem to be, uh, but, but then you get hung up on the biopolitics, like, but they're not 10. Uh, and I guess I'm seeing a parallel here that, that, that the, the male gaze is given an alibi somehow. Uh, th this, the, the woman's age conforms to the legal boundary whereby one is allowed to perform sexually, not 17, uh, but 18 acting 10 or, or, or an anime. And, and there's, there's also a gray area with illustration. Uh, what does it mean to draw a sexualized 10 year old? I, I think there's, there's also, a, people are trying to grapple with, uh, is that trading in, in uh, images of, of child exploitation? And I'm leaving a lot of these questions open-ended because that's what this course is is partly about, and I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the world of anime. I hear vaguely about it. It's not a world I know well, but I'm always interested in any of my classes, and, and especially this one, when you bring in material that I don't know about um, because of issues that, that were coming up relative to material I, I do know about. Um, and I, I do know, I know the world of anime is, is incredibly, is a course in itself, and not, not to mention and video games, which we may get into a little bit, except again, you guys know so much more than me. I, I can offer structuraling and, and, and theorizing, um, but I don't, I, I don't, I don't really play video games. I know something about them because I have kids, uh, but that's a dangerous, um, I'm once removed <laughs> from the phenomenon. Um, so your Twilight vibes, yeah. It, it, Okay, no, it's the opposite. There are some women that believe that, that too, that a woman can't be president or prime minister because they menstruate and are softer. Okay, I think maybe we've over, we overlapped on that observation. Um, culture, it seems like men are encouraged to enhance themselves, like building muscle, whereas women are told to reduce unwanted personality traits. That's a really good point. Uh, yeah, enhance, um, amplify, strengthen. Um, as, as opposed to, uh, yeah, reduce, tone it down, um, and body fat, obviously. Um, and, um, you know, quote unquote, strength in a woman is, it's interesting to try these parallel words, like elegance can, it can be a, a way to talk about the way a woman should look strong and, or, or the famous, you know, men are aggressive, women are bitchy, like you, same behavior. Why, why does it get, recast um, to, to the, the prism of gender. And, it, and that's the power of having these presumptions of what you quote unquote should be. Because if, if men are supposed to be aggressive and, and, and women are not, then aggressive women are gonna be seen as, uh, as over the line because of this construction of, of an essence, which isn't really an essence. Um, so women are told to, oh, let's see, and wait a minute, sorry, uh, as if, if men don't have hormones which affect their behavior as well. That is a good point. Uh, there was a comedian I saw the other day on one of the HBO shows, a, 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 a woman comedian who said, every time I see a 50 year old balding man driving down the street in a red Ferrari, I wanna shout out, sorry about your penis. <laughs> and I was like, 
there, there are a lot of women comedians who really do a great job. Uh, Sarah Silverman and, and others come to mind. It, it, female stand-up comedy is an amazing uh, a venue of deconstruction. I mean, I, I know they're not all sitting up there reading Derrida, but they're, they're brilliant. So many that I've seen uh, at uh, just destroying the, the presumptions of, uh, of gender performance and, and of taking this, this macho you know, guy in his red convertible and, and just shouting out the subtext, that some diminishing masculine vigor compensated by <clears throat> hotter and uh, more powerful uh, sports cars. Um, so this is true, I believe. I think the male gaze has infiltrated the subconscious and the men desire women who have the same quality as children, to be honest. Yeah, well, especially if we, it's the unmapped, you know, do, do men want women who are children? Well, hopefully not everybody, but I do think a lot of, because of the insecurities of masculinity, there is an attraction to uh, childlike uh, 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 performance on the part of the woman because it feels less threatening. Uh, because men are, are encouraged to not become aware of the degree to which they're split subjects and the degree to which their performance is, is an illusion, they, they're actually more vulnerable uh, to critique. Like women in many ways are used to being critiqued. The performance of femininity, you're told to perform. And, and, in, and in that sense, um, it's less shocking when someone calls out your performance, but to have your performance as a man called out is doubly traumatizing for the men because they, they're, they're taught to not experience themselves as performing at all. So it's not even a question of, you know, which, uh, which performance are you doing? I'm just looking I have to plug this thing in. It wants to die, but hold on. Okay. Um, but I do feel uh, that's true. Yeah, okay, so we said that. But I do feel like the problem isn't masculinity, rather it is toxic masculinity it is the problem. There are many facets of it as is, as, as is the case of toxic. Uh, femininity and yeah, Amrit, can you give me a brief elaboration from brief for now on what converts a gender performance from a gender performance to, to toxic? Um, so can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, okay, uh, I have to gather my thoughts. Um, toxic, I, I do believe it's caused by unhealthy first views and mindsets, but also an unhealthy self identity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, usually, psychological, underlying psychological issues as well, um, perhaps jealousy or things that perpetuate something that's already underlying. And, and, and most of the world is sick, I feel like mm -hmm. uh, we just don't realize it um toxicity it can be small it can be minimal or it can be like you know very very obvious as well sometimes people come across as not toxic masculinity mm -hmm. or um they may be men because we have masculine and feminine within us right yeah. um they may be men that portray toxic feminine traits mm -hmm. right you mm -hmm. may see that as well um or they may be toxic masculine traits as well that get kind of confused and i feel like it's different with every individual but um it's it's mainly i feel like is is underlying psychological issues um things that have not been dealt with yeah that, i like that that especially what you just said seems seems to get i'm always interested in the common denominators of what turns a gender performance toxic obviously in one case it'll be very individual like what was the conversation what was the event what was the incident what was the outcome but is there you know I, I look for something and what you the way you ended your comment struck me um that that it seems to the 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 uh the refusal to question the certitude of your own illusion of coherency can make you toxic because the very, I think it's in the very term. What makes you poisonous? It's, it's when there's an aspect of you that's yours that you insist on implanting into other people because you don't want to own it. And so they can, theoretically, you can get sick in the presence of toxic masculinity 
uh, domestic abuse would be, would be an overt example of this. Like, I'm sorry, I hit you, but you made me so mad. And if you could clean up the house better, I wouldn't get so mad and then I wouldn't hit you. So I am sorry, but it's your fault. You know, that that's toxic. A let of hitting a woman that would be toxic by any definition, it would be, it might be a step toward less toxicity to say, there's, some, I, there's something wrong with me. I don't know why I did that. You certainly didn't deserve it. I have to go see somebody and figure out what's the matter with me. Uh, so the, the, is that what capacity, and, and the more insecure you are and the, and the less, a, less aware that so many of the ways you feel are actually constructions, the, 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 that's going to incline you toward, toward be, being experienced as toxic by others. And part of what this class will do is to try and, try and help everybody recognize when are you being toxified by somebody else? When are they trying to make you own things that aren't yours um, and, and that in fact are theirs and you can't fix everybody? Uh, by any means, or anyone, probably you can't. So, but you can refuse, possibly. I mean, in a way, Dora wound up saying, "You got a lot of insecurities that are that your theories are emerging from." I've dealt as I've talked to you as much as I can. Um, you're not. You're 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 drilling down on your theories. I'm feeling more and more uh, constrained and confined, and so this is our last day. Um, so that that is you know part of the the pushback. Um, the response to women uh, reminds me of a cup that's overfilling, being told that the liquid simply does not fit where the cup can easily be switched out for something bigger. Yeah, that's, uh, I like that analogy. Uh, gender, or, or the, the cultural representation of bodies does tend to tell us what size cup we are. I won't, I won't even get into bra sizes, which <laughs> Sylvia Platt does, you know, A cup, B cup, C cup, D cup. What, what does it mean when you say how quote, uh, what, what the shape of women is delineated down in, in, into such um, a detail and, and suddenly the body is, is standardized in, in relation to other women's bodies like B cup, C, this woman B cup, that woman C cup. They don't, there aren't a lot of equivalencies of that for male bodies, certainly not, not revolving around penis size that is not like six inches nine inches you know I mean, it would certainly make men a little more sensitive to what that feels like um if if, if that were a common uh label that that got applied um so it is, is the imperative to burn off the cupcake quickly in part to maintain the monolith bring the mobile back to stasis as quickly as possible so that there's no observable change yes i do think that's part of it I, it, it, your figure, there, there's another 1950s ad that I save where it says, uh, it's a girdle ad actually, girdles not being strictly speaking uh, in vogue anymore, although there are other kinds of girdling that, that go on with women's bodies. But back in the 1950s, the heyday of the girdle, uh, there was a lot of different ads. Um, and this is during Soviet Plass era again, but one of the ads was uh, your body is what you're given your figure is what you make of it, uh, which is an, another sort of devastating and brilliant, unintentionally brilliant insight into the damage that's done when you convince women that their body from the start is inadequate. No matter what, no matter what your body is, it's almost like no matter what body you're born with as a woman, that's too bad. Now, but let's help you. So the ads can act like there were a lot of fairy godmothers in these girdle ads, you know, like you're, they would come and help you with the tuck in your tummy or whatever. And, but, but always there was a sense of the body you have is it, it's a given that it's uh, inadequate. Uh, try, you want him to be more of a man, try being more of a woman is, is relates that more to performance, but um your body is what you're given, a figure is what you make of it, really comes out and just says it, that you're, as a woman, your, your body is, uh, is, is, at a, is, is at a disadvantage to, well, it goes back to women in the marketplace, I guess, is that if you accept your body as your body, you're gonna be at a disadvantage 
in in the sexual marketplace where other people are in trying to enhance their asset their their value in in the comparative uh marketplace um people have mentioned how women are also not allowed to age but life has changed so when women's bodies aren't allowed to change it's like they aren't allowed to be alive the objectification is so total you're you're right and plath has a line in one of her late poems in the collection ariel where she says the woman is perfected her dead body wears a smile of accomplishment and it's they're, 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 you know they're, they're, it reminds us how high the stakes are here we're not just talking about unfortunate and unfair cultural manipulations people get depression people get anxious people get suicidal these are very very real uh effects and usually by the time you get to to this devastatingly negative effect the sources that have led to it have, have, are all obscured um i i have a, a friend who's who's a specialist in adolescent uh medicine and particularly uh, and runs an, a, a clinic in anorexia and she's always trying to shift the not least of all from long discussions with me, but trying to shift the discourse away from um, are you eating or not eating or, or how many calories and try and get back to the original source of being convinced that your body uh, is the enemy, is, is inadequate. Um, because to, to, to obsess on the symptom is, is, is to stay on the surface. Uh, it, it's something that Freud has trouble with from time to time too. So even something as simple as uh, teaching how a, a boy how to cook is uh, looked at weirdly. Um, and yeah, and that of course varies from, the severity of that may vary from culture to culture, uh, but how you divide domestic duties or, or if that's even the right way to, uh, to phrase it, but any assumption uh, uh, and, uh, that that duties are connectable in an intrinsic way to gender is is wrong. So cooking is not feminine, and, and uh, taking out the garbage is not masculine. It doesn't mean you can't divide the duties any way you want. But it, the, the the problem seems to come from this naturalization, this this insistence that it's an intrinsic connection that that cannot be interrogated. Uh, but when raising a boy to become a man, there is the whole boys will be boys thing. They're taught to be men, but not good men. Yeah, well, big boys don't cry. Uh, um, boys will be boys. The, the double standard, which I think is still out there, that uh, exper sexual experimentation before committed relationships is, uh, is, is acceptable, it's, or even, a, or even a, a, an aspect of becoming a man. The implication being that you have these casual flings, let's say, and, and then you figure out what you want and, and then you can be a good husband. Well, I don't know, maybe you can make that case, but it's it's still a double standard because experimentation in, in women who've had sexual partners uh, is seen as unfortunate um, uh, or, or even as disqualifying. Um, it, it is so that we don't quite have as much of a cult of virginity as, as, as even in the 60s that that was beginning to change this idea that that a woman who doesn't get married as a virgin um is is marked and uh a fallen woman and and other we're kind of we've we've moved away from that somewhat but there's still clearly different attitude of previous sexual experience in, in the gender uh performances uh especially if it comes to any any appearance of casualness that that's highly stigmatized in a woman like if the woman's had one or two sexual partners before a given relationship it, it, there's a pressure to to at least romanticize them like i cared a lot about them and and men don't always come under that same edict it, it can be a one night stand or, or a one week stand or something and that's that fits under the the monitor of uh boys will be boys um women are seen to be more emotional that could trigger rational behavior so a man shouldn't do anything that's part of a woman's role traditionally yeah th let me briefly say to, that gender is also a space that men fear to fall into um because you can be you can 
you can feel feminized, obviously. And Freud talks about castration or the fear, the sort of metaphorical fear of being castrated. That's a highly anatomical metaphor um, to, to fear, fear having that you're one of the distinct, distinguishing features of the male body cut off is it, it, it kind of reinforces the patriarchal in a way because it excuses a lot of boorish, if not toxic masculine behavior, if you contextualize it as, well, they were afraid of being castrated. I mean, that's so dramatic and so severe that it's, it sort of excuses uh, uh, misogyny in, 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 in a lot of cases. Or the, or the way that um, women are not just called bitchy, a lot of times in negative terms, I won't go through the list, you can supply it yourself, but uh, it's amazing how describing women who are seen as unacceptably aggressive, the terms used revolve around male genitalia. <laughs> I, again, you can construct your own list. Um, and it's like, me th thinks thou protest too much, that the, the men, are po it's, like, it's not my fault, these women, they're out to destroy my male anatomy. And it's like, well, no, I think they actually just disagreed with you at a board meeting, you know, just relax. Uh, so, so it gets it deliberately um, heightened to a, some, some kind of life and death struggle. I feel as if a lot of people acknowledge toxic masculinity as a thing, but don't realize how they contribute to it, such as men cooking being weird or men being emotional, uh, being, being feminine. Yeah, it's definitely a communal discourse in a lot of ways of, and that, that gets to the issue of reinforcement, uh, I think, Aaron, that, and, or, or even what Butler talks about with repetition and citation. If, if everybody's saying it, uh, it's, it, it, then you're well on your way to naturalizing. And whenever people use terms like common sense or everybody knows, uh, to me, that's a, sig that's a red flag to, to bore down like, What's common about this, this common sense? What, what, why does everybody, how do you know everybody knows this? What is it you think everybody knows? And, and why do you have to imagine that everybody knows it? Um, girls are always made to be a scapegoat in every situation they're in. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, especially every situation they're in. I, I think there is something about the mutually constitutive performance of gender that sets it up that when a relationship fails, it's, it is easier to identify the failure of the feminine performance than the failure of the masculine performance. Uh, so especially since masculinity is not supposed to be a performance, it's harder to, it's been traditionally harder to critique failures in the masculine performance in, in a failed uh, relationship. Um, you'll see that in the three faces of Eve. I mean, her husband has failed her on multiple levels. And, and yet the psychiatrist never it seems to ever critique how bad the marriage is, how, uh, how impossible the husband is. His demands on her are impossible and, and it's splitting her in, in different directions. But her splittings are more indicative of, of his unacknowledged splits than her. So, I mean, that's the other effect of masculinity. You, toxic masculinity, you ask the woman to split in the way that you fear you are already split uh, so that you don't have to experience the trauma of, of, of an awareness of your own splitting. Um, so women are seen more emotional, but we aren't the ones who punch holes in walls when our team <laughs> loses. Fair enough, Jennifer. I, 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 uh, men in sports is obviously a whole nother lecture, but the projection of, um, uh, of, uh, of what, of, of an essential masculinity, unlike even like a successful drive in a football game, like going 90 yards in, in four or five plays. It, it's, I mean, obviously it's, it's exciting if you're a football fan, I, I'm not critiquing that, but there's a psychological repetitive fantasy uh, of indomitability. It's, it's being rehearsed um, over and over again. It's not, that, I'm not, it's not the fault of the sport or the, or the people performing the sport, it's, it's, it's more what, what the sport is, is taken to, uh, to represent, to, to function or perform. Um, so overall, the patriarchy sucks. We seem to be drifting to that <laughs> conclusion for, for now. Um, 
and Aaron, I'm saying that men are raised to see anything feminine as negative and wrong, which makes them view women uh, as lesser, as not human. A lot of men see women as an object and a tool, not a fully functional human being. Women to them are maids, mothers, therapists, sex objects. These men say they're heterosexual, attracted to women, but they don't even like women. If these women don't submit to these men, the men can react violently. I think, I think you are talking about, partly about, because femininity is set up as a performance, it does seem to license a lot of uh, toxic masculinity to, to insist on role performance. Like, why aren't you a better mother, better maid, better woman, better lover, uh, uh, better sexual partner? On the, the list goes on and on. But what, what licenses that is, is setting up being a woman as, uh, as, as, as performing a role. Um, Amrit says, well, yes and no, because yes, men have been in power for a long time, but the views that are toxic to everyone really are created by both the toxic masculine and feminine, and of course, more by the toxic masculine. However, women have also played a part in generating these beliefs, such as how uh, there are women that believe another woman cannot be president in power. Yeah, good point. We've seen that in the Trump era, for sure. Or a woman is to be in the kitchen, raise kids, a woman works outside. Toxic feminine entities that believe such things seem outdated, but they are actually very much still here. And of course the patriarchy gives power to men. So it's easier for toxic men to perpetuate and shape beliefs. Uh, I think if I'm reading you right here, at Amrit, that it, it, I, I wanna connect your comments anyway of toxic femininity to, uh, to women in the sexual marketplace. Like when I see women tearing down other women and, and doing it from the point of view of, I know what a woman is and you're not a woman. And it's actually a woman talking to a woman. You know, what, what I partly see is the, the extent to which the sexual marketplace and, and, and then the, the creation of femininity in competition with femininity, it, it does set a kind of, so it's not, a, it, it's both toxic, but it's not the same configuration of toxicity. It, if as a woman, you've been persuaded that the role you perform is what grants you an essential, your essential womanhood. It's, it's going to set you up to critique other women. It, again, trying to defend uh, the insecurities and the gaps and the splits in, in your own position. So it's not so much that, you know, taking a role is not, necess is not necessarily toxic, but um, it, it becomes toxic when you fuse yourself into that role and pathologize anything that, that doesn't mimic the role that you've uh, assigned for yourself. Yeah, I, ex I agree with that one for sure. Yeah. What I was trying to say there is exactly that. Um, yes, women can be in the kitchen, men can be in the kitchen. The actual role itself is not bad. It's that you're not allowed to do something else outside of that or something outside of that at a certain age point perhaps is not viewed as womanly or what you should be striving for, for example. Mm -hmm. good. That, yeah. that would be toxic. Yeah, yeah good. Well, I, I, it's great that we're un, unpacking these terms. I, yes, I did mean, I think I did mean Emma, Emma Chamberlain is, is, you'll see that and when you, when you look at the prompt. One thing I, I watched Emma Chamberlain's vlog about going to her Cosmo photo shoot. And I, I, as I said, this is very new of, uh, and I'm thinking about it, like literally uh, as I'm teaching this class, I was, I couldn't help seeing it. It's kind of positive that she's, she's very comfortable whether she's in makeup or not, for instance, which I, I, I maybe I'm missing something here, but that seemed like better than before like so she gets in the car and she's tired and she hasn't had her coffee yet she doesn't have the makeup on and she's still and she's vlogging and then and then she goes and she gets the makeup and looks like a cover model and then she gives I think well a little afterward where she's home she's tired and she doesn't have her makeup on again so at least if, um, where I've understood the imposition of of women needing to have their makeup on to to, to make sure their public performance is never breached uh, by appearing without makeup. I, I, this, this young woman, Emma Chamberlain, whom I don't know, uh, she's incredibly popular. And, and she, she, her comments, when you read the comments on the vlog, I was, because I'm, I'm, I'm a student of discourse. I'm always fascinated, not with what people say, but, but also how they say it. 
the level of appreciation for Emma Chamberlain from the people who viewed this vlog, mostly women, if not all women, I didn't do an actual survey, was just that, you know, thank you for giving me permission, for instance, to, to, to not go out of the house without my makeup on. Like, you not only do that, you're on the cover of Cosmopolitan. There was an enormous celebration of, it mattered a lot that, that Emma Chamberlain, she herself was like, I don't know why they want me on the cover, but that, that lent a kind of media authenticity that you can both be what she's like in her vlogs and be on the cover. So it's very, very different. And, and as I said, this is new to me. So you guys, I'd be interested in, in hearing more from, uh, from you guys. Um, uh, so I'm conscious of still trying to get through comments because I don't want to leave before I, before I do. Too, too many, but a few are, uh, too many, but a few are means of survival, being okay with it due to abuse, pleasing the oppressor as a means of survival. Yeah. Jealousy is always fun to talk about. Usually other women oppressing other women. Brainwash, that's just stuff their moms and family believe. It is what has been acceptable and they cannot see it in, in any other way. Religion, so many reasons. Lal. I mean, women do... Um, still typically, and you guys probably know this better than me, and maybe it's changed, but there's often a stated or unstated implication when a man cheats on the woman. Sometimes people are like, well, God, what a jerk he is. That, that certainly, but sometimes there could be an unstated, particularly when the, gen, when the generation is older, is, you, oh, you couldn't keep your man, um, which is you know, kind of doubly traumatizing. Um, you you weren't enough. Uh, you had a chance. Uh, that, that's really that can be really destructive to have to deal with betrayal, and then be told it was it was actually it was a personal failing that you brought on yourself. I, I don't know that that happens so much when young women talk to young women anymore. I think it could. It did in the day. It can happen when daughters talk to moms. I know that from my own experience. Uh, sometimes the moms are still locked in a brainwash of you know, you keep a marriage together by your performance as a woman. And that's, that's part of what a woman is, is putting up with the man's BS to, to keep the relationship together. Um, so the, the patriarchy creates a vicious cycle where boys are raised to be emotionless, lest they be emotional. And this, this girly, which results in the cycle continuing. Yeah, clearly toxic masculinity is further amplified because if toxic masculinity emerges from a lack of self-awareness, and one of the bases of, of the masculine construction is don't be aware of your masculine construction, it, that, that's a really bad uh, duality there. Of uh, it, it, you, know, you shouldn't have feelings anyway, even though feelings are what you really need to tap into to understand why you're imposing your, your problems on, on someone else. Um, I remember, uh, Jordan Peterson said the masculine qualities not necessarily belong to men are much more easy to survive in the capital market. Maybe that is one of the reasons why the masculinity are so encouraged. I don't I'd agree with him 100% because services essentially need a lot of feminine quality, unlike manufacturing back in the day. Yeah, I, I think so. The masculine performance is, you know, let's face it, patriarchy was a, was, it has had a huge influence on the formation of capitalism. Uh, for even if that's changing as it as it is to some degree, even if women can be CEOs and other things, capitalism has had a 150 year head start of of being a corollary of of masculinity and, and the Trump era. If we need any reminding, not only Trump but all his various cronies, they're, they're all casebook studies of a fusion of of toxic masculinity with capitalist aggression and and free market neoliberal. Uh, politics, which comes off as incredibly bullying. Um, so I think I, I think I'm, you know, agreeing with that point. And uh, even a, a, a TV series like Succession or Billionaire or any, if you've seen any, there's a real subgenre in on Netflix and Amazon Prime of uh, of all this. You know, just you deliberately use an anatomical phrase: these pissing contests that that you see the men performing in these shows and, and the women have to either figure out how to join in the contest, but, but already the phrase has, has eliminated their anatomy uh, of how, 
how are the women supposed to be culturally legible in the boardroom of a, of a highly capitalized corporation? The, the pressure is always, sure, you can compete in this boardroom, but you have to do it inside the masculine framework where you are already fully disadvantaged. And, and again, I grew up in an era where, where the private golf courses that didn't permit women were a profound disadvantage to any women who wanted to go anywhere in business or politics because the networking, the real deals were going down on the golf course. They were going down on the 19th hole bar. They were going, they were happening in places where women were literally not allowed. Um, I don't know about other women in this course, but I remember as a child hating pink. Pink represented femininity and womanhood. We are taught to hate ourselves because society says that women are lesser. I didn't want to be seen as pink and feminine because then as a human would seen as lesser, like pick me girls or saying I'm not like other girls. Women and girls try to push themselves away from femininity to not be seen as lesser, or they try to be the perfect models of femininity and womanhood to not be seen as lesser. And, and I guess since you, you're using that, I think fairly enough, lesser gets back to women on the market, uh, asset value going up and down, being, being worth more, being worth less. It, this is where, again, I think, you have to really ask yourself, what's the source of the valuation system? Is it, is it, is it something imposed? Um, you know, like why does a stock value go from $10 to $20 or $20 to zero? There's nothing intrinsic. It's, it's all, it's, it's place in, in relative to the proximity of other things in, in the market. And that's a very uh, disenfranchising uh, context it, it, where I think, and it gets back to cultural legibility, the feminine performance, women offered a feminine performance are told that you need to compete with other feminine performances to be culturally legible. And if you're insufficiently feminine, you will be invisible. I mean, that's why we have that phrase, the wallflower, the, the, the woman who presumably can't be distinguished from the wall behind her. What, what's, what's implied behind that is that, 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 is that they don't have um, the performative quality to emerge from the wallpaper. Um, so yeah, but I don't hate pink. I liked blue, <laughs> uh, but blue is not for girls. Girls don't play with cars, robots. Yeah, I don't have time to get into my, I, I wanna do this in a subsequent class, but the gendering of, of toys for children is, is that that's worth a prompt. I don't know if it'll be the next prompt, but uh, Barbie dolls versus GI Joe, to, to just pick the obvious example. Why are Barbie dolls, why is there so much emphasis on the hair? Uh, why do Barbie dolls come with like six brushes? And GI Joes, they don't even have hair. They just have black plastic on their head. You can't brush a, a GI Joe's hair. And you, and, and you might be like, yeah, so what? But th you're giving these to children to play with. So you're, you're definitely, it's getting enculturated at every level. And I, I, when I go to Toys R Us to, to buy for my younger nieces and nephews, uh, the whole store is gendered now. I mean, you, you have the boy aisles and the girl aisles. Uh, everything is separated. Um, and these are what we give to kids to play with. There, there was an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, I had a friend of mine who exhibited there, of, of uh, women recalling artists, women who are artists, uh, who made a career as art, recalling their relationships to Barbie dolls. and. In many cases, they burned them, melted them, you know, cut the hair off. I mean, there was, there was a lot of acting out, quote unquote, vis-a-vis -vis the Barbie doll that, that in some ways predicted their emergence as artists, as people capable of, uh, of critical discourse that cut back and cut across uh, uh, sort of hegemonic discourse, as we, as we call it. Um, this, 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 this chat list is like a hydra, you know, I, I get through five comments and <laughs> there's five more, but I don't know. We'll see if I can Herculean to pick a good male role model, uh, whether I can get through this. Uh, I need to leave. Yes, I, I understand, Chris. And we're getting to a point where we're all going to have to leave because now we've gone to nine, which is fine. As I said, I, I don't mind going over as long as people are here and engaged and you clearly are. Um, if you think women are sexualized in magazines, wait until you see video games. Yeah, I, I'm a Grand Theft Auto. I know a, a, a bit, of, a little bit about, and that was 
pretty shocking. I have video games sometimes do seem to fly under the radar because not everybody plays them. Uh, a lot of the people who are currently in quote unquote positions of power, including tenured professors like me, don't necessarily play video games. And so they, they, they're, they're under the radar in a way that the cover of Cosmopolitan would not be because it's sitting there in a, in a grocery store and, every, and everybody can see it. Um, and so it's over 18, it's a daddy little girl dynamic, but there's uh, also boy as well. The bodies that these people are attracted to are not prepubescent, they're adults. It's more of a psychological play. Usually someone who wants to take care to be allowed to take care of someone and someone that's allowed to be cared for in that role, play scene at least. That's my understanding of it. I, I think this does get back to, this gets to consent and, um, you know, role playing among consenting adults, for instance, with, uh, over when both are over eighteen, this is it's it can be a little more. It seems to me a little more of an issue with pornography, where you're not in relationship with the women who are are in the videos. So it, so it can reinforce this is what women are like, or, or or whereas if you're in a relationship with someone and there's role play going on. Um, I mean, Lacan goes so far as to say you, it's hard to approach your sexual partner uh, without fantasy, not, not, not necessarily, you know, pornographic fantasy, but the body itself is, is, is to some degree a fantasy. I mean, there is a body, but then we, the body we think we know is a fantasy about the body that we have. So our, arguably, even with committed relationships when, with lovers, there is a degree of Phantasmatic bodies in in fantastic dialogue with uh, with one another. Where where I think it can get destructive is if it's not mutually reciprocal and supportive. If if somebody is if a role playing is imposed on someone else and and they don't feel appreciated and seen and valued, then it can feel degrading. It, and it's and it's less about the particular role play and and more about the perceived mutual reciprocity of, of the relationship. Um, so it's better, yes. I think the actual child is, is the breaking point because 10 year olds of either sex are not 18 year olds in terms of psychosexual social um, development. And it's, it, it's, which is why I think statutory rape, you can make that case for statutory rape that with a 10 year old, there's no such thing as consent because even if there is consent, it's, it's, it, it doesn't meet the legal definition of consent because they're 10. So you, you could tape somebody, you could tape Lolita saying, it's okay, I, I, I just said I'd go to bed with Humbert. What, what, you know, but what does that mean? Like, given that her mother's dead and she has nobody else and she's dependent on him for in the ways that a child uh, so anytime there's a distortion of dependency, um, then I th th this challenges consent. And that's, a, that's the issue with sexual harassment. When, when your boss asks you out, it's not the same uh, as, your, uh, as the colleague who has the same job as you. It's, it just isn't. Even, even if you like the boss, even and, and like, oh, cool, he asked me out for coffee. That can all be true, there's, there, but there's a, there's a power differential which I don't know if that means it shouldn't or can't ever happen, but it ought to be um, included in, in, in the awareness on, on, uh, on both sides. Um, so types of relationships fall under the BDSM practices, which means that those dynamics and scenes require communication and trust. Yeah, I guess I was trying to get at that. Age play doesn't have to be sexual. It's more about healing and caring. It, it can be about sexualizing children, but I take your point. Jennifer, that it's not inevitably um, uh, uh, about that. And BDSM, I forget what they all stand for, but it's kind of about sado bondage, sado masochism. Uh, sado masochism, at least in coming through the psychoanalytic tradition, it is is a way it is one way to try and ex exert control over sexual desire by having one person agree to submit and one person agree to dominate. And then theoretically, there's a safe word, and uh, if, if either side, you know, feels things have gone beyond their 
um, comfort. All of this speaks to the to what Freud called polymorphous sexuality. There is a tendency, you know, we we t- we try to lock down like, okay, you're grown up now. You you've identified as heterosexual, homosexual, transsexual. So that's that's your orientation. Um, and so go ahead now find lovers that correspond to your orientation. But a lot of this denies the, the polymorphous element that, that, that the body is not born sexed. Um, it's not born with even with, with erogenous zones. I mean, it's, it's born with nerve endings, some of which are more sensitive than others, but deciding which parts of the body should or shouldn't be touched is also a way to erogenize uh, this part of the body versus that part of the body. That's it's something else we can uh, talk more about. James Joyce famously insisted that women going to confession in the Catholic faith created eroticism in a strange way because they were taught where they should have allowed their boyfriend to touch them and where they shouldn't have. And, and when you do that, you also introduce the reverse and that is the, the allure of the, of the taboo. Uh, and, and so you can actually sexualize a woman's body by giving them penance for what transpired uh, in, in, the, in their relationship. Um, so they might have mental health issues, but to say two adults engaging in a scene dealing with age play isn't, uh, isn't wrong or illegal. Um, well, no, that's, we're back to consent. You know, everyone, the people are over 18 uh, and there is a, 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 there's no coercion and there would seem to be consent and there isn't a power differential. This is where, this is where the job market gets really tricky uh, because if you can get fired by someone, how does that affect the way you, whether you agree to, to certain uh, role play? or not. Um, so yeah, also mental health issues have nothing to do with sexual desires and self-healing. Well, sometimes, <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> I mean, this is an open-ended class if that's not clear. So there's going to be lots of issues that, that come up that are going to be generated by the class, but not necessarily resolved. And, and, and we can keep folding in what the class brings up um, but I won't be able to give you answers to everything, nor, nor, nor will you, but I might be able, as I like to say in A10, I might be able to help you ask better questions um, when you feel imposed on and controlled and constrained by answers that are imposed on you. This class might help you figure out how to ask better questions. Dora tries to ask Freud questions. She does ask him questions. And then I think she stops because every time she asks a question, he's more than happy to answer. It. But he only answers it from the, 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 the already inscribed position of his, of his theory. You know, so she asked, so Dora will say, so, but why did I dream of hair cake? And he's like, I'll tell you, this is why, and this is why. And so she stops asking questions. Um, there are ways of, typically I find that one way to push back against feeling like answers are constraining you. It's try and ask questions to get at the structure behind the answers. Like don't ask questions, don't, don't question the answers. Question the source from which the answers are emerging. Why are these the answers that are emerging? Like I don't, mean, I don't have any questions for these answers. I have questions for where they came from. That, thing, and that, that would have, if possible, that would have helped with Dora. Like where are these answers coming from? And, and the answer was, they're coming from my need to prove my theory, which is different than offering an answer to, to someone's uh, question. Um, so, yeah, so we, Jennifer, you're still bringing up the issue of uh, consent. And that's right. And that is, that's the reason laws are very, the reason we have statutory rape laws is precisely that, that there's, uh, saying it's okay is in and of itself is, is cannot, you can't know whether that's consent or not out of context. Um, there are people who feel like they can't say no. And, and certainly a child could easily feel that in relation to a, a, a caretaker, for instance. Um, yeah, so let's see. 
Class discussion. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I see attacks. I just see uh, like real. You know, in, in a way, it, 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 what we're, we're what, what we're doing in this class is stripping or what, is taking off the guardrails a little bit, because guardrails also uh, restrict you. And uh, what I tend to do in my classes is I fold back the discussion into the into the material. So I want you to bring a lot of the what happened tonight into your reading of of the three faces of Eve and to the path uh, uh, element. Um, so, yeah, so let's see, I can't, it's hard to, to completely curate the conversation. You can't say that adults engaging in a certain type of sexual relationship are, uh, pedophilias or pedophilic. If, if I'm following you, following this discussion, I think a lot of it is, is it, pedophilia is a legal term. To, well, that's confusing because it's a legal term and it's a clinical term used in the DSM uh, as a mental illness, uh, but it's also illegal. And pedophilia is illegal. The illegality of pedophilia is predicated on the age of the bodies. The, the predilection toward pedophilia as a mental issue isn't strictly speaking illegal. Uh, and, and to role play age play uh, among uh, uh, age appropriate consenting adults is also not, uh, it's, it is not illegal, but these are all gray areas. And, and if I were to draw any attention to this, it's that when you, uh, when you start to notice that social regulation generates the reality that it pretends to be organizing, you you then begin to, to wonder uh, about social regulation, which I, I guess is something I would in, encourage us um, to do. So the legality around pedophilia is about exploitation um, because what follows all too much from sexualizing a, an underage adult is it's it quick it can easily and quickly get sucked up into capitalism through, child prostitution through, uh, through pimps uh, um, who essentially become the exploitive father figure to make money off, uh, off the women with, or the young, I should say, the girls uh, with paying customers. That, that, that this is part of the slippery slope that we're um, talking about. Um, so I don't know if we can fully, <laughs> I, we need, I mean to come up with a prompt perhaps because you guys are definitely generating some interesting stuff. Um, an adult acting like a child to provide sexual gratification to their partner or to perpetuate a power dynamic can be har harmful inside and outside. It can be. This is not a question of what consenting adults do behind doors, a question of what these tendencies often stand to, to represent or gratify. So I, I think I think the issue here is uh, where, you know, where do we come up with boundaries? Because in general, we like to let adult relationships be private. And, but it's it, clearly it's uh, how we relate privately perpetuates various social constructs. Like whether that's taken out the garbage because you're the guy uh, or whether you're age playing, it, 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 everything does. And maybe some more than others, and this is worth a discussion, but all that the law can do, and in some degree, all that psychology can do is, is look for that point where the acting out is hurting and exploiting the, the others in, in a way that can register, um, that, that helps. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm, I'm just trying to go down to the longer comments. I agree it's harmful when it perpetuates a culture of sexualizing young children. However, the role playing between consensual adults may also be a way for the adults to safely explore their own experiences. Pedophiles were themselves victims of pedophilia, consensual role playing. This is, this, this is a, a, a raging debate that, 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 you're, that you're raising, um, Ty and Stevie, I guess, whoever, uh, is that uh, to what extent is acting out role playing uh, a safe outlet for what might otherwise be illegal, injurious practices. Does pornography promote sexual assault in some manner? Does pornography 
uh, uh, make uh, reduce sexual assault by by offering uh, video representations of it. I I'm not sure that's going to be that's a fully answerable question because I it, it can also get to who who is doing the viewing and it, and it has a real chicken egg quality. I mean, to what extent do your might your proclivities draw draw you into representations? And then is it really the, is it the representations that gen, that they create that that implant the behavior, or was it an, a proclivity that seeks uh, authentication? and then possibly amplification. So th these are not questions that people have been able to give a, 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 a single answer to, um, but it gets back, I guess part of what this discussion has veered into, which is fair enough, is what are the, and then we'll be getting into this more in the rest of the class, but in the, what's the relationship between bodily construction and actions? Because we haven't talked about that much in this class, in this in this open class, and it's not strictly speaking a big part of Dora because Freud's not he's not in a relationship with Dora, he's not having a sexual relationship. There may be transference and countertransference, but it's a case study. Uh, but when we get into the movies that we're going to see and so on, it's, it's going to get a lot more complicated. And um, there is a there. What is the relationship uh, between the effect? Of, uh, of an imposed construction on the body and behavior. I guess that's what's been, been coming up. And, and then when, how do we define illegal behavior, immoral behavior, perverse behavior, uh, quote unquote normal behavior? Because very often normal behavior is simply licensed and, and authorized behavior. So we have to be careful because the binary normal per perversion can be used at, by social regulation. But that also that, that doesn't mean that it's that, you, that people don't exploit other people physically, uh, uh, sexually and physically. Um, so where are we with this? Yeah, this may have to be continued. <laughs> Which good thing we have twelve weeks. Uh, so I, I will look at the rest of this chat. Um, I mean, I'm going to go to the last. The last uh, comment, just, just in the completely false assumption that it summarizes all the comments I'm skipping for the moment. Um, but it, anyway, it says, um, well, okay, the last two comments by Emma. I, I'm, I saw something similar in, in uh, Emma Chamberlain's um, Cosmo interview, where she says being called an influencer is, quote, disgusting. Yeah, I noticed that too, that kind of jumped out. But the interviewer repeatedly calls her an influencer regardless and refers to it as her job title. I found the since you've read this, since you saw the clip, uh, Emma, and hopefully the rest of you will, the, the, the that was part of the, that was the Cosmo clip. That wasn't her, her, her vlog. There was something weird about the older woman um, insisting that Emma was cooler than her that I also found a little, can I say cringy? I'm not always sure that my kids assure me I never know what that word means. But um, so I'm not allowed to use it in, in my house, but <laughs> it's my class, damn it. But you know, but a awkward, you know, sense of like uncomfortable is the way I'm using it at the moment. Like she's like, I'm now wearing green lipstick. Uh, sorry, green uh, nail polish, uh, which I never would have picked for myself, but now I know it's cool because Emma picked it out and Emma's cool. And it, there's a, it's a kind of a door moment where Emma's like, hello, I'm kind of talking out loud about who I think I am. And you're saying, oh, yeah, I heard everything you said. Oh, by the, by the way, you're an influencer because um, I need to frame. You're on the cover of Cosmo. I, 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 and Cosmo sells nail polish, by the way. So you can, you can also see that. Uh, well, I, I don't think, I don't know if Emma Chamberlain gets into this quite as much because she hasn't had my classes. <laughs> but she, she, she's not yet too worried about um, is she being used as a photo op for uh, for consumerism. Um, I don't know that that's her intent. And she does say influencing is disgusting, by which I think she means partly, I, I really don't, I, Emma, don't really want to think of myself as someone who influences people to buy stuff they don't need. But then the woman is kind of like, yeah, I know, but that's the point of Cosmopolitan Magazine is to persuade people to buy stuff they don't need. How are you supposed to sell all this? 
the, 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 hundred, the thousands, hundreds of ads in, in every magazine. Um, yes, the, 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 uh, the prompts are due, whatever prompts I give you, and I'll be more clear just as we go along, Renad, but I, I try and get you to complete all the pre-midterm prompts by the time you turn in the midterm. I, I, sometimes I'm flexible depending on how that's going. That's partly I'm trying to do you a favor. I don't want you to save the prompts to the last couple of weeks, but I also don't want to impose deadlines for every prompt. It's, it's, it's a nightmare to enforce. And I'm, that's not what I'm trying to do with the prompts. I'm, I'm trying to encourage you guys to have fun commenting and engaging. And so I don't want to do a discipline and punish here where I, where I mold you into good students by imposing punishment or, or not getting in your prompts on time. Cause I'll get what I deserve. If I do that, I'll, I'll I will get uncurious, uninspiring, uh, wrote prompts that you just submitted to, so you don't have to go to jail, so to speak, <laughs> it said that you don't get docked. Um, so it could relate to a nature versus nurture, surroundings affect preference, sexual preferences, but most sexual romantic relationships between consenting adults is subjective. The person you select as a romantic or sexual partner is typically a choice and comes down to your consenting preference. Um, and by the way, I don't know if any of you are in my uh, my uh, other class so I'm teaching tomorrow, B76. We're starting with the Hollywood romance. And it happened one night is the first film we'll be looking at. And um, I, can, I have a prompt in that class about you, where you guys are. No, you're not, not you guys. You guys in that class, I'm, I'm asking you to go find a love song and a love song that celebrates the partner and a love song that um, laments the relationship you know, basically most of Taylor Swift uh, art, <laughs> that's not entirely fair, but most, I suppose in general, most romance songs are about the breakup, but there's some that are celebrate how happy I am to be in the relationship because um, romance is to some degree, a, 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 a passionate romance um, is one where for how you balanced it out. Your mobile is balanced with someone else's mobile. So you're not bumping, you're not knocking each other's mobile out of alignment every time you say something, but it's still two mobiles. And that, that is the reason that breakups happen. And they're also why they're hard to do. And the, the, the divorce rate is 50%. I mean, people 55, I think even. So you can, you can even that committed a relationship can break. So we do have to look at um, the, the pluses and minuses of romantic attraction is to a degree that romantic surge that's not just sexual is predicated on feeling seen as one would hope to be seen and and when that's reciprocal and i'm not critiquing this or or, or judging it I, uh, um it's it's very powerful the problem is it's also a little bit fragile and if you're not self-aware that um that there's no really no such thing as a perfect mirror for your preferred self. It, it it can lead more quickly to the breakdown of the romance. One one can feel betrayed, not because a partner had an affair or cheated on you, but if we place if if we equate romance with someone mirroring back to us our ideal self, it's going to be really hard for that romance to last, and it won't really be the fault of of either participant because the, the bar is too high. And, and we'll see that in Hollywood romance and presumably Bollywood too. I wanna get in a plug here to, that I, I already announced this, but uh, we're hiring another cinema professor and uh, in, in uh, cinema of the global South and our first candidate, and you're, you're invited to zoom into the teacher talk. Um, I think I put it on this site. Is, is a talk on Bollywood um, and, and capitalism and, commodity culture. And she's going to be talking about a, a star whom I don't know. Everyone presumably has the moniker of King Khan, K-H-A-N. And, and he's looking at his career, which means I'm going to probably watch a Bollywood movie. So if anyone's got, uh, if anyone knows who King Khan is and and has a link to a, to a good Bollywood version where he stars, um, send it to my email. because. <laughs> I, I need to do this fast because she's, she's giving the talk on uh, on Thursday. Um, so, oh, love bug, Jonas Brothers. Okay, I don't know that one, uh, I, but it's a, it's one of my funner. It's one of my fun prompts because I, I get to hear all these 
love songs that, that uh, I know the ones, I know my favorites, but they're all, a lot, a lot of them are really old. <laughs> Not surprising. Um, so I'll have to, we'll see about Love Bug, see if that shows up. Okay, I sort of am at the end of, uh, of this. So I'm gonna run away. Um, before, oh, this is King Khan. Okay, thank you. So I, I can maybe find something on that. <laughs> I, I've seen the odd Bollywood. I, 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 I think they're great. And I, I may try and come up with an extra credit for the romance, Hollywood romance class where we invite them to see a Bollywood. I, uh, there's, a, there's a Bollywood called Chapka Chapka maybe, I, I, which sort of borrows the plot of Pretty Woman, um, which is the third Hollywood romance we're, we're discussing in, in B76. But of course, it's full of all these un uncles and aunties. That's the thing I noticed about Bollywood romance. It's like, it, versus Hollywood, the extended family. It's so, so different than, uh, than the, the, you know, usually in a Hollywood romance, there is the man and there's the woman. There's, there's no family. There's no nosy aunties or, or comic relief uncles stumbling around in, in the background. And, and yet they borrow Hollywood plots. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great, uh, uh, chant. So Manobatin, I'll, I'll have to have a look at that. <laughs> but, oh, good. Well, maybe I'll see you guys on the, uh, in the teacher talk, which is something like Thursday, at, I think uh, something, uh, God, I don't know. I've been posting so much. Um, but anyway, classic nineties movies. Okay. Well, it's exciting. It's exciting for me. We're going to we're, we're when I first came into the English department. I just started teaching the odd cinema class 20 years ago. And then there was so much enrollment in those classes that we hired uh, Professor Maurice, whom you may know. And, and then we made a minor literary, and then that minor program doubled and tripled in size. So we, we hired uh, Professor Saljugi, and now it's gone off the charts and the, the deans want it to be a major. And it, they agreed to let us hire again. Uh, and I said, well, let's we got it. Let's do Global South because I, I want the uh, I want the program to be international. Um, so it's exciting to me that we're going to be making yet another uh, hire. The cinema is a growth industry inside UTSC English right now. Fourteenth uh, at ten a.m. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. All right, I'll sign off. We've gone. We've kind of gone way over, which is okay. I don't mind because we we were actually. Uh, um, having a really productive discussion. Remember, the purpose of this open class is to generate, in some degrees, is to generate loose ends. So don't be frustrated if you're like, oh my God, I understand less now than before I signed in. That's sort of the point. Um, we need to challenge what you think you know to make room to, to, to learn something new. And, and that is a process that, that almost inevitably has, has what I call productive confusion might be a way to describe tonight and, and the chat room, productive confusion. I'm not afraid of confusion and I encourage it, but I'm always trying to, to, to make sure there's a degree, there's an element of it that's productive. Um, so thank you very much. Wait, wait for my, I will get, I will do a new pre-tape lecture before we open it up again next Tuesday. It'll, it will be more about Dora more, and more about Plath. I will have read some of your Cosmo stuff I'll have commented in the responses and I will bring that I will bring them up in I'll bring up some of the things I saw you guys doing in my next pre-taped lecture. So we'll keep trying to, to make it all organic. Okay, thanks. Thanks to everybody uh, that you were huge. You, you are the reason this uh, was an interesting, exciting discussion, because honestly, there's only so much I can do talking to myself. So uh, thanks for coming by. Hope, hope to see you next week. In, encourage anybody you know to, to check out the tape if they weren't able to be here or if, if anybody had to duck out, they can always come back and get more. All right, I'm going to have some hot chocolate <laughs> and move on to the final phase of my evening. But uh, nice to see you guys and we'll see you again uh, at least next Tuesday, if, if not the teacher talk. Okay, bye for now. And I will post this within the next hour. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm.